Life is all about choices. The choices you make today have the power to affect every area of your life and reach beyond you and shape your future. You're the one that determines the level of your relationship with God, not God. In fact, God is more passionate about drawing near to you than you are to Him. Get what you need to make wise choices so you will flourish. We use our mistakes to be a lesson for the next generation. International best-selling authors John and Lisa Bevere bring you transforming insights that can make a difference in your life and in the lives of those around you. This teaching is both relevant and impacting, addressing issues you care about and equipping you for the everyday challenges we all face. The power of the New Testament saints is available to every believer today. Intimacy with the Holy Spirit is the next step for every sincere believer. See, this is what Jesus is talking about. You shall receive power. She knew the power of praying in tongues. In this teaching, John Bevere explains the simple but necessary steps to receiving the promise of the Father. I was in prayer a couple months ago, and God had just really placed a burden in my heart that many people today in the church that have been filled with this Holy Spirit are drawing back from walking a Spirit-filled life. They're drawing back from the power of the walk of the Holy, walking with the Holy Spirit. Then there are many in the church today that I'm talking to that don't believe the power of walking with the Holy Spirit is available today. And so if we don't begin to proclaim this, we may lose it as a generation of people, and we're not going to lose it. Amen? James chapter 4, verse 8, one verse. This has been like my verse for the last six months, and that is this. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Everybody say that with me. Draw near to God, and then He will draw near to you. Now, isn't it interesting? We are the ones that draw first. There is something that we can do, we can initiate, that will literally cause the one who placed the stars in the universe with His fingers to draw near to us. And it's available to everyone. Are you with me? Now, in that same chapter, just a couple verses late, earlier, we read this, and this is, an, that, you know, what I just read you, or what I just quoted you, is a very famous, well, very well-known scripture, I should say. But just a few verses earlier, we read, or do you not know that the scripture says that the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Everybody say yearns. Now, the Spirit of God in us yearns for us. Everybody say yearns. yearns. To yearn means to long for intensely and consistently. That means he is yearning for our attention, our fellowship. David made this statement in the book of Psalms. He said, Lord, how great are your sum of your thoughts towards me. He said, if I were to count them, I couldn't because they're like the sands that are on all the seashores of the whole planet. They are more in number than every single grain of sand that's on this planet. Now, that's a lot of thoughts. Now, when I was engaged, I thought about Lisa quite a bit, but not that much. Are you with me? And being engaged to her meant I wanted to communicate with her. Folks, let me tell you something. We serve a talking God, a communicating God. He is yearning for our fellowship. He is yearning to speak to us. Just recently, the Lord spoke to me and He said to me, He said, Son, did not I say in my word to pray without ceasing? And I said, Yes, you did. And He said, Son, is prayer a monologue or is it a dialogue? Is it a one-way conversation or a two-way conversation? I said, It's a dialogue. It's a two-way conversation. He said, So if I said to you pray without ceasing, that means I'm willing to communicate without ceasing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he's always speaking words. There are other ways to communicate. My wife can give me one look, and I can write three pages of what she just said. <laughs> Why? I've lived with her for 20 years. I know how she communicates. Are you with me? But yet God is desiring. He's passionate. And yet I believe the Holy Spirit is the most ignored person in the whole church. Now, if you ever have any problems with rejection, especially with family, go talk to the Spirit of God. He knows all about it. I find it amazing that people can get into their car and ride 20 minutes to work and not say one word to him. Yet, can you imagine sitting next to a person you're carpooling with for 20, 25 minutes when he, from the time he gets into the car till the time you get to work and you didn't say one word to him? 
I mean, he's here. He's, he's the one on the earth. Jesus said, I'm going away. As a matter of fact, look at John 14, if you have your Bibles. I want to I see here what, the, what Jesus said. John 14. In verse 15, John 14, John chapter 14, verse 15, we read, If you love me, keep my commandments. And then he immediately goes to this next statement, which is not an accident. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another. Everybody say another. another. Now, another is from the Greek word alas, which means another of the same kind. There's another Greek word heteros, which means another of a different kind. Are you with me? In other words, if I say, I'm going to give you another piece of fruit, and I just gave you an apple, I could give you an orange. I would give you another of a different kind. Isn't that right? I give you another piece of fruit, but it's a different kind. If I say, I'm going to give you another of the same kind, that means if I gave you an apple, I'm going to give you another apple. Jesus is saying, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Helper is the Greek word parakletos, which means one who is called to another side for aid. Now, the word parakletos is found one place in the epistles, and that is 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And that is where it says that we have one advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. The word advocate is parakletos. So, in essence, what Jesus is basically saying is, just as I have been to you, so the Holy Spirit is going to be to you. That is why he goes on to say in the 16th chapter, look at the 16th chapter. Look at verse 7. Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Now, would you look up at me? I think this is amazing. He's been with these men for three years, three and a half years. Everything he has ever said has come to pass. I mean, he speaks to the storm and it stops. He curses the fig tree. The next day they walk by and they go, man, it's, it's dried up from the roots. Nothing he has ever told them that would come to pass didn't. He's never told him one lie, but yet he's got to preface this statement with, guys, I'm telling you the truth. Why does he do it? Because what he is about to say to them is so mind-blowing. He wants them to understand, I'm not kidding about this. Are you with me? He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Everybody say, your advantage. He's, in other words, it's better for you that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, the parakletos, will not come to you. He said, it's better for you that I leave. Now, wait a minute. He's healed every one of their sick. He's provided for them. He's told them the things of God. If you had a question about what God was doing, you just go talk to Jesus because he's God manifested in the flesh. But yet he says, it's better for you that I'm, I'm going to go away. That's why he had to say, I'm telling you the truth. Why was it better? Because you see, folks, if you wanted to ask Jesus a question, you had to wait until Thomas was finished. And then Peter was pretty outspoken and pretty domineering, so you had to wait till he was finished. And then you tried to get a word in, but then James spoke up, the th son of thunder. And you were trying to say something, but you know, everybody else was beating you to the punchline. And then, you know, he did have to sleep a few hours a night. And if you needed something from him, you had to find out, because if he was in Galilee and you were in Jew Jerusalem, you couldn't, you know, you had to go find out where he was. And if you're in Detroit and he's in Jerusalem, it's going to be even harder. Because you may not have enough money in your account to get the first class ticket or the second class ticket or the third class ticket or even go in the baggage compartment to get over there. Who knows? You understand what I'm saying? It's difficult. Are you with me? So what he's saying is it's better that I go away. Why? Because when I go away, there's another one coming just like me. And he doesn't sleep. And he's in Detroit. And he's in Colorado Springs, and he's in Jerusalem, and he's in Cape Town, South Africa. In fact, he's saying wherever you go, that's where he's going to be, because he's not only with you, he's in you. And he doesn't sleep a few hours a night, he's always ready to go. So now if I need to talk to him at 2 o'clock in the morning, he's there. Are you getting this? Now can you imagine... Walking the shores of Galilee with Jesus and never asking him one question. Never having any conversation with him. That is how ridiculous it is today when Christians do not engage with conversation with the Spirit of God. Because as much as real as Jesus was on this earth, that is how real it is that he's living in us. Are you getting this? 
So now, let's go over to Acts chapter 1. I want to show you some things. We've got to lay a foundation. Because what I've got to say to you tonight, I cannot finish this morning. I'm going to have to finish it tonight, so you do not want to miss tonight. Acts, the first chapter, please. I want to look at the fourth verse, chapter 1. This is after Jesus is raised from the dead. This is the day he is about to ascend to the Father. In verse 4 we read, "...in being assembled together with them, he commanded them..." Everybody say, "...commanded..." Amen. "...not to depart from Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Father, which he has said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now." The Greek word for baptize is baptizo, which means to be immersed or overwhelmed. We get our word overwhelmed from it. Now look at what Jesus said to them. He commanded them. Everybody say commanded. Amen. Did he suggest? No. Come on, I didn't hear everybody. Did he suggest? No. Did he recommend? No. no. He commanded them not to do anything. Don't start churches. Don't go preach the gospel. Don't have ministries. Don't do anything until you first get the Holy Spirit. He said, this is the promise of the Father. What is the promise? Where was the promise of the Father first spoken to the children of Israel? In the book of Joel, it shall come to pass afterward, God said, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh means all nationalities, every race and creed of people. And he said this. He said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And upon my men's servants and upon my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. That was the promise of the Father. Because God never desired to dwell in buildings made with hands. Solomon built the most beautiful building ever been built. Make the 16th chapter look like a piece of junk. It was beautiful. But yet God didn't want to dwell in that temple. I mean, you build me a beautiful house and give me a choice to dwell in a, dwell in a beautiful house alone, or you give me a chance to be married to a gorgeous wife who I can have fellowship with, I will take my gorgeous wife. Are you with me? I'll take her in a field over that some big building all by myself. Are you with me? Well, God's no different. God said, why do I want to build it, dwell in some building? I want to dwell with people that I have created that I'm in love with, that I want to have intimacy with. That's been his passion all along, folks. And so Jesus said to them, don't go, don't go anywhere. Because I have paid the awesome price to have God dwelling on the inside of you so that I can dwell on the inside of you. If you go back to John, he said, I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. How is he going to come to us? Through the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, he is called. Folks, he's one. Three different persons, but one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're God, they are one God, but they're three different persons. Water is a trinity. Water can be ice, water can be liquid, water can be a steam. It's all water, but it's three different forms. Are you with me? He said, I want to come dwell in your hearts. I'm coming by my spirit. So he commanded him. He said, don't leave because the promise, what the Father has promised is coming. Everybody say the promise. The promise. So go to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, now Pentecost is not a New Testament term. It's an Old Testament Jewish feast, okay? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now look up at me. Isn't it interesting that Jesus ministered to thousands and thousands of people? And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, when he was raised from the dead, he spoke to 500 and appeared to 500 brethren. And he told all 500, go to the upper room. But after 10 days, it's interesting, there was only 120 left. Those 380 didn't get what the 120 got. Why is that? Because I'm going to show you this later. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. Peter made it very clear. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. I'm going to tell you this. People will not receive the Holy Spirit if they want to maintain control of their life. That is why Jesus said over and over and over, the only way you can follow me is to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. When you lose control. The problem is today we have too many people in the church that want to maintain control of their mental facilities, their emotional facilities, and they want to run things the way they want to run it, not the way God wants to run it. You will never experience the power of the flowing of the river of God, which is a type of the Holy Spirit, unless you allow yourself to let go of control. Good preaching. This is why so many people are not filled with the Spirit of God. 
Because they still want to maintain control. That 120 were doing exactly what Jesus said. They had the attitude, we're going to that upper room, and if we rot, we're not leaving. If he has to raise our bones up, we're not leaving. They were obedient. I can show you in Acts chapter 10 that God will give his spirit to those who fear him. The people that fear him are the people that say, whatever you want, I want. Whatever you love, I love. Whatever you hate, I hate. Where are the other 380? Where are the other thousands that he ministered to? There's 120 because they're obedient. They're in one accord. They're dead to themselves. They've given up control. Amen? Now watch this. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them, and they were all filled. Everybody say Filled. Say filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues, other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Everybody say they were filled. They were filled. And they began to speak with tongues. They began to speak with tongues. Say it again. They were, they were filled. And they began to speak with other tongues. It didn't just say they were filled, because if they didn't speak in the other tongues, you wouldn't have had the people, the church born that day. Because it was them speaking in other tongues that caused the multitudes to hear the wonderful works of God. They were filled and began to speak with other tongues. Let me say, filled, other tongues. They go together. Say it again, filled, other tongues. You can't separate them. Are you getting this? Now, you know what happens, don't you? This whole city hears the noise of the Spirit of God and they come out and here's all these men speaking other dialects. The wonderful works of God. Because there were men from all over the world. God had it for the Feast of Pentecost. Jews from all over the world, from other nations. And they heard them declaring in their own dialects, their own tongues, the wonderful works of God. So they said, what is this? They thought some of them were drunk. Others said, what could this be? They could see it was a wonder. And so Peter stood up and began to preach. And he said, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. This is the promise of the Father. And then Peter preaches Jesus to him. And you go to verse 32. And this is Peter's message. Peter says in verse 32, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise. Everybody say the promise. The promise. Say it again. Say it again. Now, are you starting to get this? Look up at me. Are you equating the Holy Spirit with the promise of the Father? Remember, Jesus said that he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem until what? You received the promise of the Father. I could show it to you in the book of Luke. It's there as well. So Peter says, look at this in verse 33. Therefore, being exalted the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise. Say the promise. The promise. Of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me read this. He poured out this which you now see and hear. Everybody say this with me. See, see. And, hear. and hear. Say it again. See, see. And, hear. and hear. So, with the promise is evidence. Are you seeing this? You know, the devil always does things perverted. Did you know that? He always perverts things. Whenever you see the Spirit of God coming on somebody in the New Testament, He comes in with a noise. There is evidence. You can see and hear. But when He leaves, He leaves quietly. Samson knew not that the Spirit of God had departed him. He got up to do what he always did again, and he couldn't do it because he didn't know the Spirit of God left because the Spirit of God always leaves quietly. But when the devil comes in, he comes in quietly, but when he leaves, he leaves with a noise. Totally different. Are you getting this? So Peter says, this is the promise that you see and hear. Everybody say, see, see. And, hear. and hear. Say it again. See, see. And, hear. and hear. How did they hear? They heard them speaking in tongues. They heard them prophesying. Are you getting this? So Peter goes on to say, look at verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you, watch this, 
and you shall receive the gift, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 39. For the promise, everybody say the promise. promise. Now look up at me. What is the promise? What they saw and heard. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Hello? Now, I want to ask a question. Are you a person that is afar off as many as the Lord our God are called? If you're born again and you've been baptized in the name of Jesus, you've given your life to Him, are you one of those that are many as far off as the Lord God called? Then is the promise of the Holy Spirit for you? What comes with the promise? What you see and hear. See, let me tell you something. I'm so tired of seeing the church robbed of a great gift that God has given to every person that's born again. Because there are people today, listen to me, there are people today that say, well, well, you know, you can get the Holy Spirit and be saved and get filled with the Holy Spirit and not necessarily speak in tongues. Now, wait a minute, can I show you something? I'm going to walk you through every single incident in the New Testament where somebody received the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you that there was outward evidence of seeing and hearing in every incident. Every one. The other thing I want to show you, because I've had people say this to me. Well, you know, when you're saved, that's when you get the Holy Spirit because you can't confess Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit. Now, listen. That's true. You cannot confess the Lordship of Jesus without the Holy Spirit. He's the one that has to draw you. But just because you do that doesn't necessarily mean you're filled. Because I'm going to show you in the Word of God that it is a separate experience. I'm going to show you that people got saved in the New Testament and then after getting saved got filled with the Holy Spirit. First place is Acts chapter 8. Go there with me. Now remember, we're looking for two things here. Number one, we're looking to see that the Holy Spirit getting filled with Him is a separate experience from the new birth. And number two, we're looking to see that whenever the Holy Spirit is received, there is evidence. Everybody say, outward evidence. Oh, I tell you, I'm so excited. Look at Acts chapter 8. Now we've got a guy here named Philip who waited on tables. He's just serving in the church, and God promotes him and says, go down to the city, I'm going to give you the city. I love it. And Philip, look at verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, a classic evangelist. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles, which he did. See, that's the reason a lot of the church is not walking in the power, because they're not walking the Spirit-filled life, and therefore we don't have these kind of things happening. Because Jesus said, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power to operate above human ability. Verse 7, For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Look at verse 12. But when they believed, everybody say believed. believed. Say it again. Believed. Philip, as he was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Now, would you look up at me, please? They believed what Philip was preaching about Jesus Christ, and they were baptized in water. Are they saved? Come on, please, everybody answer me. Are they saved? Absolutely. They believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they were baptized in His name. Are you, are you with me? Now, there are people today that say this. As soon as you get saved, you get all the Holy Spirit you need. Now, now listen to me, folks. I, there's a concern here. Because I'm, I, I'm sitting earlier this year with a very, very precious minister who is spirit-filled, a great minister. Been spirit-filled for 20 years. And I'm reading a book. And I, as I'm reading this book, I'm, you know, I'm sitting there reading it and, and this, and, and I can tell the guy's not spirit-filled. Christian book. You say, how can you tell? My mind gets tired. <laughs> Whenever I talk to people that are not filled with the Spirit, they talk out of their heads, and it's very tiring. It's like doing physics. Physics is interesting, but you can only take it for so long. But whenever I talk to somebody that's spirit-filled and they talk out of their spirits, we can talk all night. Yeah. 
See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Bible says he compares spiritual things with spiritual. He teaches that wisdom which human words do not speak, but that which the Holy Ghost gives. There's a flow there, a spiritual flow, and you don't get tired in that arena. You can talk a day or two days. You can preach a couple hours and people still sit there like this. I go to preachers all the time and I preach for two hours and nobody leaves. The pastor says, nobody leaves. I said, that's because I'm preaching out of my spirit to them. I'm not talking to their heads. I'm preaching to their spirits. This guy really, really has, is outspoken against charismatics. I said, well, it's very obvious. I can see he's not spirit-filled. And, and, and this person said, oh, they're, they're, they're spirit-filled. And I said, no, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Whoa, wait, wait a minute. And I had to start walking this person through the New Testament, showing them that it was a separate experience. That people were saved and then had to get filled with the Spirit. See, here's the sad thing today, folks. There, because you know, right after this comment was made and I discussed it with this person, I sat there and, and I happened to, to, to have had some time to think and I thought, you know, the Jews wanted a relationship with God the Father apart from Jesus. I mean, look in John, the Gospel of John, they would say things to Jesus like Moses is our teacher. God is our Father. What do you think? We're a bunch of... Uh, you know, bastards or something like that. I can't remember the word they used. They said, but God is our Father. And so they were saying to Jesus, we got a relationship with the Father, with God. We don't need you. Now, they weren't saying it that bluntly, but that's basically what they were saying. Now, this thought hit me today. There are people today in the church that are trying to have a relationship with Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit. Now, here's Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, standing right in front of them, and they're saying, no, we already got a relationship with God. We know God. Today, we have the Holy Spirit in the church, in the earth, and people are going, I got a relationship with Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. I don't want this stuff. I want control. I got a relationship. I don't want this. Now, here's the really scary thing. Jesus was hard to avoid because he's standing there in the flesh. The Holy Spirit today is much easier to avoid. Are you still here? So now, I want to ask you something. Are they saved? Come on, I'm going to ask you again. They had believed Philip. They were baptized. They believed what he preached about Jesus. They're saved, right? Look at verse 14. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, what does the Bible say? You are born again by what? Not corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed by the word of God. So they had received the word of God. Are they saved? Yes. All right. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Are you seeing this? For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. And when Simon saw that through the laying out of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Everybody say, he saw. he saw. Now it doesn't say in this verse right here that they spoke in tongues and prophesied. However, what's going to cause a guy who's a magician to offer them money? He saw them speaking in tongues and prophesying. He saw the power of God come on them, and he saw them begin to speak in tongues and prophesy. He said, I'm going to give you money. I want this ability. So there again, we find out that what? Receiving the Holy Spirit was separate from being born again, and they spoke in tongues. There was something that he saw. Everybody say saw. saw. All right, go with me to Acts chapter 9. The next incident occurs with a man named Saul of Tarsus. Saul is on the road to Damascus to put to death believers, right? Jesus appears to him, and Saul gets saved. He gets smart and gets saved. Are you with me? Because Saul says, who are you, Lord? Right? And then the Lord reveals himself. He says, I am Jesus. And so trembling, look at verse 6. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, let me tell you something, folks. He got saved right there. Are you with me? He got smart, right? So now he goes to the city, and God speaks to this man named Aeneas. He says to this guy, the Holy Spirit says to him, I want you to go and pray for Brother Saul. And Aeneas says, this guy is killing Christians. And the Lord says, no, he's a chosen vessel of mine. 
He's not a called vessel. He's a chosen. Chosen means he's already chosen. Called means there's something there. A lot of people, many are called, few are chosen. Are you with me? Are you with me? God says he's already saved. He's my chosen vessel. So now watch this. Verse 17. And Aeneas went his way and entered into the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. Everybody say, Brother, brother Saul. Saul. Why does he say brother? He's already saved. Got saved three days ago. He's a chosen vessel. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So is it a separate experience? I said, is it a separate experience? Now, you say, but Paul didn't speak in tongues there. No, he didn't. But I will tell you in 1 Corinthians 14, out of his own testimony, he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. Amen? Go to Acts chapter 10. You will find in Acts chapter 10, in verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Italian regiment. This is a Gentile. This is a man who was, in verse 2 we read, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household. So here's a devout man who gave alms and prayed continuously even though he was not born again. Are you with me? He has a vision. God was touched and moved by this man's giving and by his prayers, and so he sent an angel. The angel says, send for a man named Peter who's dwelling in Joppa. So he sends his guys to Peter right before the guys get there. An angel, or excuse me, the Lord gives Peter a vision, and the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter and says, what I've called clean, do not call common. Right? Right at that time, the men from Cornelius come. They go with Peter. They go to his house. And then look at verse 24. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. Look at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted. Peter begins to preach. Jesus doesn't even get five paragraphs out of his mouth. And in verse 44 we read this. While Peter was still speaking these words... The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How did they know the Holy Spirit was poured out? Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Look up at me. How did they know that they got the Holy Spirit? There was evidence. Everybody say there was evidence. How do I know you got a haircut? Because your hair's shorter. That's the evidence of it. <laughs> How do I know you gained 50 pounds? Because you're you know, wearing bigger dress sizes or suit sizes and you look bigger. There's evidence. Outward evidence. Are you with me? How do I know you graduated from high school? Because you held up your diploma and showed it to me. Are you seeing this? How did they know they got the Holy Spirit? Did they just say, oh, we received by faith? We got it. They saw it and heard it. Acts 19, last place it happens in the New Testament. Acts 19. Acts 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. Everybody say disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not so much whether, heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And then he found out that they were baptized into John's baptism and John, ba John bore witness of Jesus Christ, correct? Yeah. All right, so if we look at verse 5. So when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them after they got baptized, there's a time interval, whether it's 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, there's a time interval. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Everybody say, they spoke with tongues and prophesied. There was evidence. Are you getting this? Now, there are some people that say, but now listen, John. The Bible says and teaches that tongues will cease. Now, before you quote something out of context and show that you have ignorantly believed what Dr. So-and-so said instead of what Jesus said, Let's see what the Bible says about that. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. That's where they pull that. 
out of context stuff. And we will see, and you can answer this for yourself. Have tongues ceased? Verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Love never fails. Good place to say amen. amen. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Now don't stop there and build a doctrine around one verse. Let's keep reading. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which... So the part that he's talking about is the tongues and the knowledge and the prophecies, right? Correct? Keep reading. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I, now, some people say the perfect that has come is the Scripture. Don't take that one verse and build a doctrine around it. Keep reading in context. All right? When is that which is perfect that he's talking about? He's going to tell you. Verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then. When is then? When the perfect comes. But then face to face. We will see his face as he sees our face. Now I know in part... But then I shall know just as I am known. Now, can I ask you a question? Do you know the Lord just as he knows you? No. no. We see through a glass darkly. The perfect hasn't come. I'll tell you when the perfect's going to come. When we're standing there looking at him face to face. <laughs> then tongues will cease. Then prophecies will be, no longer be needed. Why? Because he's right there. All we've got to do is talk to him. Yeah. Face to face. Yeah. Are you with me? Are you seeing this now? So don't take one scripture. But somebody says, yeah, but wait a minute. You're trying to tell us that every believer is supposed to speak in tongues. Yes. Because Paul says, I wish you all spoke with tongues. Yeah, but Brother John, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say, do all speak in tongues? Well, now don't take that verse out of, out of context. Let's go and look at that one. You're right there. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now, look at verse 27, we'll read there. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Then he asks, are all apostles? What's the answer? No. Are all prophets? What is the answer? No. Are all teachers? What is the answer? No. Are all workers of miracles? What is the answer? No. no. Wait a minute. He's talking about public gifts here. Is every believer supposed to heal the sick in Jesus' name? Yes. But he's talking about the gifts of miracles here. He's talking about apostles, teachers. He's talking about prophets. He's talking about workers of miracles. Look at verse 30. Do all have the gifts of healings? No. That is a spiritual gift given for public ministry. Is every believer supposed to pray for the sick? Yes. Minister and heal the sick in Jesus' name? Yes. But we're talking about public ministry. Are you seeing this? Look at the verse one. Or the next one. Do all speak with tongues? No. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the gifts of the Spirit that are to be ministered to public assemblies. Or to the lost. To reach the lost. Are you with me? Because he talks about it over here in verse 12. Look at this. He says in verse, chapter 12, verse 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. Everybody say different kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of tongues. He is talking about public ministry. Now this is what people do not understand. The Bible specifically tells us about four different kinds of tongues. Two of the four are for public ministry. Two of the four are for our personal walk. Now listen to me, people. God is partial in giving gifts for public ministry. Not everybody is a Bishop Wallace. Not everybody in this room, you're not going to be a bishop. You're not going to be an apostle like he is. All right? Not everybody's going to be a prophet in this room. Right. Not everybody has been given the gift of speaking in diverse tongues to public assemblies. But every one of us have been given the gift to speak in other tongues in our prayer life, in our personal walk. Because God is partial when giving public gifts, but He is not partial in our personal walk. 
in our personal walk, He gives everybody freely the same thing. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen, some of you. And this is what we've got to understand is that 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, Paul goes in and out of talking about our personal walk to public ministry. And that's where people get tripped up. See, let me tell you about the four kind of tongues. Number one, tongue. Is the tongue as a sign to the unbeliever? Where do we find that? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. Turn over there with me and we'll read it. Everybody say, tongue number one. Now, of course, this is my order, not God's order, okay? Is tongues as a sign. Everybody say, a sign to the unbeliever. Look at verse 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to the unbelievers. Now, look up at me. What is this kind of tongue? This is a tongue when we speak in another earthly dialect which we do not have any mental ability to speak in. Are you with me? This is the tongue that you see on the day of Pentecost. That is when the apostles who were unlearned, untrained men spoke languages of all over the world, and the men heard them speaking them. And he said, these are ignorant men. They've never gone to university. They've never learned these languages. Yet they're speaking perfect dialect in my language. Are you seeing this? Now... I could tell you stories about this. One just happened just a few months ago. I'm preaching in an assembly, and one of my staff members is sitting in the very back. Now, you know the kind of people that come into the back of services sometimes, okay? They come late, and they want to be in the back, and they want to check things out, okay? Nothing wrong with that. And then sometimes there's very hungry people in the back. Don't get me wrong, but a lot of times you get some people who are kind of like, well, if I can slip, I can slip out easier back here. So she's in the very back. Now, I'm preaching for two hours that night, okay? My staff member is interceding for me, praying in tongues, okay? She thinks. She's pre praying in a heavenly language. At the end of the service, this man, nice dress, turns around and looks at her and said, Ma'am, did you know that you were speaking in perfect old dialect French the entire time he was preaching? He said, because I am a French instructor. He said, not only were you speaking French, you were speaking perfect old dialect. He said, do you speak French? She goes, parlez-vous français? <laughs> she goes, no. He said, well, let me tell you what you were doing. You would be saying in perfect French a scripture, and right after you got done saying it, he'd say, turn to that scripture. <laughs> it blew this guy away. That was a sign to him. Are you getting this? I have another friend who's a minister. He was on a TV program, and this is owned by a secular company. And all of a sudden, he feels the urge to speak in tongues. And so he just let it rip. <laughs> See, he's in the river. And all of a sudden, his mind kicked in and said, wait a minute, this is a half-owned secular company. This is a huge station. What if they don't allow this? And he kind of looked at the host, and the host wasn't motioning for him to stop, so he just kept going. Then all of a sudden, he stopped waited for an interpretation, but there was none, so he just kept talking in English. Smart man. Why? Because after the program, this lady comes running up to him. She says, brother, brother. She said, you, do you know what you did? Do, I didn't know that you spoke uh, German. He said, ma'am, he said, I don't speak German. I can barely speak English. <laughs> she said, brother, you not only spoke German, you spoke the perfect dialect of the old language. And he said, you, she said, I speak German. You told you spoke to a woman on the TV program, and you told the woman the disease she had. You told her what to do, how to pray, and when you did, she fell onto the floor. When she got up, she was healed, and she just called me and spoke to me in German and told me what you did. Are you getting this? And isn't it interesting when she called, she got the counselor, one of the only ones probably that spoke German, because there was a German in a neighborhood in the area of that city they were in. That's tongue number one. Tongue number two. Everybody say tongue number two. Is tongues for interpretation. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14, verse 5, please. Paul says in verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you would prophesy, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. What is this tongue, this tongue for interpretation? Look up at me and I will tell you. 
This is a tongue when we speak a heavenly language, not an earthly dialect, a heavenly language. Are you with me? When we speak this heavenly language, we need somebody to interpret it, not translate it, interpret it. There is a difference. Translation is word for word, interpret it as this is what it is. All right? That is when a person gives a tongue in a public assembly and somebody else has the interpretation of it. It is a language nobody in the earth knows, only heaven knows it, but God supernaturally gives the interpretation to somebody standing by or to the one who gives it. Are you with me? Now, this has happened to me many times. I have been in, let me tell you something. I have been in so many services, and especially this happened when this really, really blessed me. This, this would happen back in the days where I, I, I wasn't as known. And I would go into churches, and nobody would know about my ministry. They really didn't know the kind of vein that God had called me to minister in. And somebody would give a tongue, and another person would start giving the interpretation, and the interpretation was the exact message that was in my heart to preach to the church. And I'm sitting there on the front row going, my God, thank you for co confirming this to me. Because God had just spoken. Because what I was carrying was so strong, I thought, maybe I need to back off. Maybe this is a little too strong. And yet God would have somebody speak it and be the exact message God was going to have me bring to church. And I'd sit there and start weeping. That person didn't even know who I was. Didn't even know who my, our ministry. Didn't know anything about our ministry. I've seen this happen over and over and over. Are you with me? Now, the third one that I want to get to. Now, those first two were public ministry. Everybody say public ministry. Now... The next one I want to get to, hmm, the next one I want to, next two I want to get to are, are for our personal walk. Everybody say our personal walk. Okay. Number three, tongues for intercession. Everybody say tongues for intercession. Romans 8, 26 through 28, and I'm going to read it to you. Please don't turn there. This is out of the New Living Translation. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress. What is our distress? For we don't even know, number one, what we should pray for, or number two, nor how we should pray. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Articulate speech is what it literally means in the, in the original. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Now, the third tongue, which is a personal tongue, is the tongue for intercession. Now listen carefully to me, folks. I remember when I was in college, you know, I got filled with the Holy Spirit after I getting saved, months afterwards. I got saved in my college fraternity, and you know what I noticed? The next several months that I was not filled with the Holy Spirit, I loved God, I was born again, and if I died, I would have went straight to heaven. But I did not have the power of God in my life. It was very difficult for me to live a Christian life especially when I'm living in a college fraternity. It was very difficult for me to be a witness. I'd try witnessing, get nowhere with people. Sometimes I could get it, get them somewhere. I remember, but, but you know what? I started reading my Bible and I saw that there was another experience with God after being born again, and I wanted it. And I remember going to the campus leaders meeting that led me to the Lord. And we were all going around the table, all these leaders, and they were saying what their prayer requests were. And one guy said, well, you know, I'm praying that my roommate gets saved. I said, great. The next guy said, I'm, I'm praying I'm making a B average this semester. And then they came to me. I said, I want the Holy Spirit the Bible talks about. Where, you know, where you speak in tongues. They said, brother, we'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> I didn't know. Well, my friends that brought me walked me out and said, John, they don't believe in this. I said, what? I said, it's in the Bible. They don't believe in it. Oh, you mean they don't believe the Bible? Well, I, I, I was almost going to hell for 19 years of my life. Yes. Going to a church that did, did explain things away. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. They don't believe it? Now, I'm frustrated because I can see I'm lacking something. Anybody that's not filled with the Spirit speaking with other tongues, if you just be honest, if Jesus stood right in front of you right now, you could not say to him, no, I don't want the Holy Spirit. You may be able to say it to other people. You may be able to say to me. You may be able to say to some preachers or some Christians, but you would not be able to say it in front of Jesus. You would not be able to look at him and say, now, Jesus, I know it's passed away. And you know what? I don't want to get crazy because some of those people are crazy. Come on, John. Do you mean to tell me you could look at Jesus and say that? No. And, you know, that's why Jesus said the only way you can come into the kingdom is become like a little child. I just said, I want it. I want this. 
Because here's the thing I was experiencing. Yes, I knew I was saved, but it seemed God was distant to me. And so I got desperate. I started for looking for people that didn't say, well, that doesn't apply today. I started saying there's got to be somebody out there that has experienced this because the Bible says it is to your children and your children's children and as many as called the Lord. I said, I'm one of those. And I said, Mark 16 says, these signs shall follow them that believe. I'm a believer. They will speak in new tongues. How come? I said, I got to do it. So I'm hungry. Are you getting this? See, folks, everything in the kingdom comes from faith. But if we preach unbelief, that's not good. I'm just reading on the plane the other day about in the book of Job. The Spirit of God spoke to me. He said, read Job. And here I'm reading Job. And here Job, listen, Job's got these friends. And you know what? They're speaking all kinds. They're preaching messages that are not accurate about God. And God's not doing anything. God will never show up and manifest an atmosphere where people lie about Him. Where people say that what He said, He really doesn't mean. Are you getting this? And so here's these guys preaching all this. And then in chapter 32, here comes a guy named Elihu. And man, he's a preacher. He gets up and says, you have spoken rebellion and, and arrogance against God. He says, Job, you need to repent. And he turns all of them and he starts preaching what God says. And he preaches the true word of the Lord. And you know what happens? After he's done, God comes in a whirlwind. And then God says, hey, Job, your friends have spoken incorrectly about me. They've spoken words without knowledge. Now, isn't it interesting that it always takes somebody to come and preach what God is saying before God shows up? God didn't come in the whirlwind after Job spoke, after his friend spoke. He came after Elihu, the prophet, spoke accurately, and then God came to fix it. Why in the world, in these churches that say the Holy Spirit, well, you don't need to speak in tongues today, why isn't he showing up? Because they're preaching what is not accurate. Are you getting this? Why is it, why are people getting healed? Why is it God manifesting? Why is it that I walk into this church this morning and I start crying? Why? Because I walk into this room and God's spirit is all over this place. And I begin to weep. Why is it I go into some churches and it's dry, it's mental, it's boring, it takes long to get done with the services. Why is it that I preach to you now 55 minutes and I only feel like I've spoken to you for five? Because there's life here. The Spirit of God is saying what He wants. So when I got filled with the Holy Spirit months later, you know what happened? Oh, He's there. I smiled all the way home. I laughed and giggled all the way home. I woke up the next morning smiling. He was right there. I said, man, I haven't smiled like this since I was a little kid at Christmas. There was awareness that he was walking with me. He was in me. And you know, these, these people, listen to me. These people, listen, listen. These people, they come up to me. Now you have to understand, God spoke to me. He said, I've called you to the body, not just to the spirit-filled people. So these people, they're, they're drawn to our ministry. The publishers, they want to publish our books that are evangelical. Now, or, 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 or this group, or the Baptist stores are carrying our books. And you know what? They could, you know what they say to me? They said, John. We love your stuff. I said, why? This is because it's, it's, it's saturated with the Bible. It's saturated with the Word of God. And he said, we are, we are just in awe of the, of the knowledge you have of the Scriptures. And I'm sitting there going, these guys study eight times more than I do. And what they don't understand is I got the teacher. Hey, I'll be honest with you. I'm dumb. I mean, my SAT score in the verbal was 370. That's out of 800. That's below 50%. These guys probably got 7, 800. These are great scholars. These are smart men. And I'm sitting there going, are you getting this? People will come up to me and say, what, what's your scripture memory program? We cannot believe the way you just fire out scriptures. I say, I don't have a scripture memory program. I tried it and I forgot everyone I memorized. Why is that? It's the Spirit of God. He will bring things up. He will bring things up in my spirit. Listen to me. He'll bring things up to me in my spirit I haven't read in a year. Why? Because Jesus said He will take the things of mine and bring them back to your remembrance. He will show you things to come. He will teach you. He will testify of me. That's what Jesus said. Are you getting this? 
So anyway, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, I had a vision. See, people that are not filled with the Holy Spirit don't have visions. Your young men shall see visions. They shall prophesy, speak in tongues. It's all in the same breath. I saw myself preaching to all the sorority and fraternity kids on Purdue University's campus. So I did what I saw. I started a Bible study for all the Greeks, Greek people on Purdue's campus. I invited them to all come. So in our party room, where kid, guys got drunk in our house where girls got laid, I started having an all-campus Bible study. Are you with me? And you know what? We were having guys and girls, I mean 20 guys in my fraternity got saved. 60 guys hated my guts. You know, what one, you know what the vice president said to me? He said, why can't you be like the rest of the Christians in this house? Well, the other Christians he was talking about were the ones that weren't spirit-filled, right. that really weren't making a difference. Right. Right. Now listen, they passed out tracks. But what bugged them is I was getting little sisters saved. God was using me to lead them to the Lord. And they were, they were going to bed with half the guys in the house. And they'd start preaching to the guys because they get filled with the Holy Spirit and turned on. And they start preaching like fireballs. See, look at Peter before he got saved. He's hiding in the closet. Look at him afterwards. He's out there preaching. He's out there saying, hey, whether I obey God or you, you judge. He turned into a different man. So I started this all-campus Bible study. And kids are getting healed. Kids are getting saved. Kids are getting delivered from devils. As a matter of fact, they walked into the fraternity, or, or, or into the three of the brothers, walked in one night during our Bible study. You know, there's 60 kids in there. And I lay hands on this one guy, and he goes out into the power. They went to the, our house advisor was a Catholic priest. Said he's doing exorcisms. So the Catholic priest got up in front of the whole campus and said, don't go to that Bible study. And here he's my house advisor because there's a boy there doing exorcism. And you know what? They came now. Oh, yeah. Best advertisement. So anyway, I, I, I started preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm preaching about it every time. Well, there was a girl who was brought up in the church that taught her, well, it passed away. Tongues aren't for today. And you got all this Holy Spirit you need when you got saved. Come on. But she saw what I read to you in the Bible today. Come on. And she got filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with tongues. Woo, she, she was Alpha Phi. They lived in this sorority right next door to us. She danced out, was so happy. Well, the next morning, she comes bursting into our fraternity. She said, I got to talk to John. I got to talk to John. So she comes in. I meet with her. She says, John, you got to hear this. I said, what? She said, John, I was sound asleep. And all of a sudden, I woke up. And she said, I kept hearing inside, praying in tongues, praying in tongues, praying in tongues. She said, so I start praying in tongues. And she said, you know what happened? She said, I prayed for about 45 minutes, and then I felt a release. Now, here's this little sweet girl that was brought up in this very traditional church saying this already. And she said, I felt a release. And she said, and 15 minutes later, 6 in the morning, my roommate got a call, an emergency call. Her grandfather had a massive heart attack and miraculously recovered. She said, John, the whole time I was speaking in tongues, I knew I was praying for an old man, and I didn't know who. She said, God spoke to me. My roommate got the phone call. That I was praying for my roommate's grandfather, and he miraculously came through. Now, see, it says, it says right there, we don't know what to pray, and we don't know how to pray. Everybody say, we don't know what to pray. Now, let me, let me, let me just say this. Do you know what's happening in Afghanistan right now? Do you know what's happening to the preacher that's locked up in China in jail right now for his testimony of Jesus Christ, who they're about to torture, who needs prayer? Do you know how to pray for that guy? No, you're limited to your mind. Are you with me? Yes. See, here's the thing, folks. Look at it this way. If I walk into the President of the United States office, I got to communicate to him. On, look, he's got to communicate to me on my level. I don't know what's happening in the government. I don't know what's happening with this advisor and this security man and this, this cabinet member and this guy. And this. He does. I don't. He can't really talk to me because I don't understand the codes and all the other stuff. He's got to come down to me on my level. When I walk into the King of the Universe's office, if I go to him and I pray just in my mental understanding, he's got to come down to my level. But God says, I don't want that. I want to have intimacy with my children on my level. So God says, I'm going to give you an ability to talk to me on my level. Because, because, because the Bible says, look at this in chapter 14, verse 2. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. God says, I've given you the way to be able to speak to me on my level. See, President Bush has got to come down to my level. I don't understand what he understands. I don't know what he knows. I don't know what God knows. I don't know what he understands at all yet. But you know what? God says, I'm going to make it so we can talk. And then he says, pray that you interpret so you can get the understanding of it in your mind. That's why I meet people that are spirit-filled 
some of these people really know how to pray in tongues. Like Sister Jean Wilkerson, my grandmother in the spirit, went home to be with the Lord April 20th, 1987. I'm telling you, when that woman prayed in tongues, the hairs of my arms stood up. First time she got in my van, my jaw dropped. I said, this woman talks, she doesn't talk about God. She talks as if God is her best friend. I mean, no, 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 folks, you got to understand. This woman, I'm telling you, she started talking about God, and I went, wow. And here I am, Bible school, been in the ministry four years, and I'm going, wow. And she said, oh, John, we prayed 20 years in our basement, me and a group of women. And she said many times in those 20 years, God would have us pray for the Vietnam War. She's about this tall, white hair, okay? I'm going to tell you, you'd shake if you were around her because she was so strong in God. And she, she'd go, and many times when we prayed in the Vietnam War, we'd run up against world rulers. And I think about it, you know, I think that one war on that one little plot of soil changed the whole course of the world. We were champions before. Afterwards, we were the laughing stock of the world. Yes, there were world rulers involved in that war. And she would speak things, and I'd sit there and go, I can see that in the Bible, but I never saw it when I read it myself. Because she knew the power of praying in tongues. She spoke with God quite a bit. He who speaks an unknown tongue doesn't speak to men. He speaks to God. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I will pray with the spirit, in the Spirit. I will pray with my understanding. I'm going to go quickly. Why do we speak in tongues? Number one, we can communicate with God on His level. Number two, it defeats our weakness of not knowing how to pray, what we should pray. Number three, it edifies or builds up our spirit. Number four, it strengthens our faith. Number five, it gives us the ability to worship and give thanks at a much higher level. This is all scriptural. Number six, it reveals the hidden counsel of God. That is a big one. Number seven, it gives us rest. Number eight, it brings refreshing. Let me say this. Tongues, just the ability to speak with tongues is a great benefit of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But that's not its purpose. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What is that power for? To be a witness of His resurrection. This is what many people who do not speak in tongues and are not filled with the Holy Spirit lack, and that is the power. To be a witness of His resurrection. I remember one time, I started witnessing to three, started telling three guys on the street. I met them on the street, start telling them about Jesus. They put up with me for about five minutes. They were like, we're out of here. They didn't, they didn't want anything to do. They didn't want anything to do with what I was saying or didn't want to hear what I was saying. So I said, all right, guys, it's been good talking to you. I went to shake their hands. When I went to the first guy. He pulled his hand back. He said, no, no, don't touch my hand. Because I went out to grab his hand. He pulled his hand back. I said, what's wrong with you? He said, well, we just came back from the hospital and he had done something to where his thumb was in excruciating pain and he couldn't move it. And I don't know what the, he gave me the medical term and all that, but I didn't know. And I said, hey, guys, no problem with that. I said, when Jesus died on the cross, not only died for your sins, he died for your sicknesses and diseases. And I said, you know what? He's alive today. And I said, he's the one that healed every sick person that came to him in the Bible. Now, they, now, now I got all three of their ears. I said, now, brother, let me just tell you something. I said, just give me your hand. Let me pray for it. God will heal you. Well, let me tell you, that sinners are like, shoot, man, pray. Some Christians go, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> That doesn't line up with Dr. So-and-so said. Dr. So-and-so said the day of miracles and tongues has passed away. Why don't you quit listening to what Dr. So-and-so said? Because all he's doing is filling your heart with doubt and unbelief. And everything in the kingdom comes by faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God, not the word of Dr. So-and-so. So I said, give me your hand. I said, Father, that this man may know that Jesus died on the cross for his sins, was raised from the dead so that he might have eternal life. Heal his hand. Bam. I said, now give me your hand. He said, I said, give me your hand. Now, listen, on purpose, I went and grabbed it like that. And when I did, his eyes went like this. He said, I can't do this. I can't do this. Look, I can't do this. And it was so funny. He kept saying, I can't do this, but he was doing it, you know? <laughs> now, they're all ears. All three of them got saved. Oh, yeah. I'm at another function. My wife back then was a makeup artist. I'm purposely finding things before I was a preacher. Because this is for the believers. My wife's in a makeup company, and I got to go to one of her functions, and I got to sit across the table and look at this blonde that's a makeup artist for two hours, and I figure, well, you know what? I'm going to preach to her. So I started preaching to her, and you know what? She was like, oh, my. And Elise was getting a little uncomfortable because these were her colleagues, and I'm like, no, I feel to preach to this girl. 
So I'm preaching. She's just like, well, finally, she, she got up from her chair and she was like this. And I said, what's wrong? She said, well, I have scoliosis. She said, I've had pain in my back all my life. I have scoliosis, curved spine. I said, oh, no problem. Started in again. <laughs> now she's all ears. I said, you want to go pray? She said, yeah. So Lisa and I go out in the van. We pray for her. I feel her back move in my hands. I feel it. She gives her life to the Lord. She got instantly healed. I'm preaching to a bunch of prisoners one time. And the Lord, listen, I start preaching. And this guy's back there like this. He's, he, you can tell he's the angriest one of them all. Well, I didn't realize this. He had his tooth abscess. And the Lord gave me a word about it. The guy comes up and gets totally healed of the tooth abscess. And the next week I come back, he's in the prison ministry saved. <laughs> See, this is what Jesus is talking about. You shall receive power. Well, let me tell you something. People that don't want, listen, are embarrassed about tongues. Well, Jesus said, if you're ashamed before, of me before men, I'll be, I won't confess you before the Father. You're going to be ashamed. Listen, listen. You're going to be ashamed of what he died to give us, the promise of the Father? And then you want power, but you don't want to speak in tongues? It all is one person. His name's the Holy Spirit. He is not an it. He is a person. And he is the one that is the power of the Trinity. And the way his power manifests is through what? Various different ways. Tongues, miracles, healings, all different kinds of ways. But Jesus said every believer should be casting out devils. Every believer should be speaking in tongues. Every believer should be healing the sick. Amen. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? Luke 11, Jesus said, ask the Father in my name and he'll give them to you. All you have to do is ask in faith. I have prayed for people before and said, well, I tried it. I was just sitting with a very famous evangelical the other night for dinner and I was telling them. And he said, well, I prayed once and it didn't work. So now you know what he's doing? He's basing truth off of his experience instead of allowing truth to dictate his experience. Let me say that again. Some of you missed it. Never, never, never interpret truth through your experience, but rather call, listen, or rather allow truth to dictate your experience. If it says it in the Word of God, I believe it. And that's the way I was those four months. I didn't care if they told me they don't believe in this and explained it away to me. I said, I don't care. I had another guy call me and say it was of the devil. I said, I don't care. And he was a friend of mine. I said, I saw it in the Bible. I want it. And God gave it to me. And nobody had to teach me how to speak in tongues. When the power of God hit me, I just went, I just started speaking in other languages. Amen. This life empowering message is a presentation of Messenger International. We want to stay in touch with you. Visit us on the web at messengerinternational.org and request the Messenger newsletter. It contains timely articles, powerful testimonies, outreach programs, and John and Lisa's current itinerary. Log on and receive our free catalog. It features our extensive collection of books, curriculums, interactive DVDs, CDs, and audio and video tapes. Be a part of what Messenger International is doing. We'd love to hear your testimony, and if you want information on partnership, please contact us. In America, write to our world headquarters at Messenger International, P.O. Box 888, Palmer Lake, Colorado, 80133. Toll free, 1-800-648-1477. In the United Kingdom, write P.O. Box 622, Newport, NP198ZJ, United Kingdom. Telephone 0870-745-5790. In Australia, write P.O. Box 6200, Doral, D.C., New South Wales, 2158. Telephone 1-300-650-577. Everybody in the church can be his friend. Life is all about choices. The choices you make today have the power to affect every area of your life and reach beyond you and shape your future. You're the one that determines the level of your relationship with God, not God. In fact, God is more passionate about drawing near to you than you are to Him. Get what you need to make wise choices so you will flourish. We use our mistakes to be a lesson for the next generation. International best-selling authors John and Lisa Bevere bring you transforming insights that can make a difference in your life and in the lives of those around you. This teaching is both relevant and impacting, addressing issues you care about and equipping you for the everyday challenges we all face. The Holy Spirit does not communicate to our heads. 
where He speaks, where He enlightens, where He illuminates is in our spirit. Learning to hear the voice of God means strengthening our spiritual hearing. In part two of Intimacy with the Holy Spirit, John Bevere teaches on communicating with God. Now this morning I quoted to you James chapter 4 verse 8 which says, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Now that's an amazing scripture and that's probably been my theme for my personal life the last six months. Because as I said this morning, I've never been as hungry for the presence of God in my entire life as I have been the last six months. But God says that if we will initiate and draw first towards Him, then He will draw near to us. I find that absolutely amazing. God is waiting for us. The Spirit of the Lord God is waiting for us to just initiate and draw near. He's waiting. He's waiting for you. Because James chapter 4, verse 5, just three verses earlier, says this. Or do you not know that the Scripture says that the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Jealously means He will have no rivals. You cannot love the world in Him too. You will never experience a love relationship with the Holy Spirit if you love the world. Just never forget that. He will have no rivals. But He yearns for us jealously. Everybody say yearns. Yearns. To yearn is to long for intensely and consistently. He yearns for us, folks. David said if the sum of his thoughts towards us were counted, it would be more than the sands that are in the seashores and the entire planet. He longs for us. Amen. Paul makes this statement, but you know, before I read this statement, James says the Spirit who dwells in us yearns for us. You see, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus said, it is better for you that I go away. Why? Because when I go away, I'm going to send another parakletos. Jesus is referred to as the parakletos. This is a Greek word in the New Testament. Parakletos means one called alongside to help, to aid. Jesus said, I'm going to send another of the same kind. That's literally the Greek. He said, one just like me, and that's the Holy Spirit. Why did he say it was to our advantage that he went away? Because if Jesus was here today, you'd have to fly to Jerusalem and find him. And he can only talk to one person at one time. Oh yeah, he can answer one person's question and speak to a multitude, but he can only address individually that one person or a group, a massive group. But he said, when the Holy Spirit comes... He said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Why? Because I'm coming in Him. He is the Spirit of Christ. See, God is one God. He is three persons, but He is one God. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three different persons. You can see many scriptures, in the New Testament especially, that says how God, the Father, anointed Jesus, the Son, with the Holy Spirit. There's all three right there. If you look at creation, you will see God said, let us make man. He didn't say, let me make man. Let us make man. Three different persons, but they're one in purpose, one in person, in in purpose, I should say, amen? Water is a trinity as well. Water can be what? Steam, it can be liquid, it can be ice. Three different distinct characteristics of water. And so Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away because I'm going to send another of the same kind. The beautiful thing is the Holy Spirit never sleeps. He never slumbers. He can talk to 10,000 people at the very same moment. Because why? He dwells within us. What He's always longed for, God is dwelling within us. Amen? And you know what's amazing? Bishop, you said tonight you've never before sensed the presence of God in this building as you did tonight. But you want to know why? We talked about Him this morning. Whenever you talk about the Holy Spirit, He comes. Do you know, He is the only one of the Godhead that if you ever blaspheme Him, you have no forgiveness. Jesus said you can blaspheme the Son and still have forgiveness. That is why the Bible so specifically tells us, do not grieve the Spirit of God. Do not quench the Spirit of God. Why? Because God the Father and the Son have so protected the Spirit of God He is absolutely mighty and He is absolutely gentle. That's why He is is talked about as a mighty rushing wind and also He's as gentle as a dove lighting upon a person. He is a talking God. When He has thoughts towards us that are innumerable, guess what? He wants to communicate with us. 
Are you with me? And so Paul makes this statement in 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter and the 14th verse. He said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the communion, everybody say communion, communion. of the Holy Spirit be with you. All, amen. Everybody say the communion, communion. of the Holy Spirit. Notice he does not say the communion of the Son. He does not say the communion of the Father. Do we have fellowship with the Father? Absolutely. Do we have fellowship with the Son? Absolutely. But Paul is very specific in saying, may the communion or fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you. Now, I looked up every single, in every single Greek dictionary and reference aid that I have, what this word communion means. And I found out that it means fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. fellowship. It means social intercourse. Exchange, especially of thoughts or feelings. Everybody say social intercourse. social intercourse. It's an exchange of especially thoughts or feelings. I found out that this means sharing together. It means partnership and participation with. Everybody say partnership. partnership. You know, let me just read to you some of the statements that you find just in a few chapters in the book of Acts. I want you to hear how the Holy Spirit is communicating with His people. In Acts 8, 29, Then the Spirit said to Philip, So the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, Go near and overtake this chariot. In Acts 10, 19 through 21, While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. There he is speaking to him. Acts 11, verse 27 and 28, Then one of them named Ag Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit of God that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world. Acts 13, verse 2, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit spoke. Are you seeing this? Acts 15, verses 27 and 28, The apostle said, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Now notice, here's a group of men that are writing a letter saying, You know, this seems good to us, and it seems good to the Holy Spirit. Talk about partnership. See, he was part of the meeting, folks. You know, many, many times when I meet with my board, my, my, my staff members, we welcome the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge his presence coming in, because I tell everybody, I say, I'm not the leader of this ministry. I tell my staff this all the time. They say, you're the boss. I said, uh-uh. I said, the Holy Spirit is. I remind them of that constantly. Are you with me? Acts 16, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. See, notice he forbidden them at one place and then he did not permit them. Acts 18, verse 4 and 5, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified. Acts 19, verse 21, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit Acts 20, verse 21 and through 23. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, and not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city. So the Holy Spirit was speaking to Paul in every city about what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. See, there's a communication here. In Romans 9, verse 1 and 2. I tell you the truth, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Do you see the communication? Now I looked up this word, Communion in the Webster's Dictionary, and Webster's Dictionary defines this word as intimate fellowship. You know, folks, I'll just be honest with you. A few months ago, I was at the place where I was in deep prayer, and I cried out. It was early in the morning. I said, Lord, I said, if you, if I can't have intimacy with you, if I can't have communion with you here on this earth, then take me out. Just take me home. I said, I cannot live here without communion with you. Now, when I prayed that, my knees started to shake. I thought, you know, I really mean this. And, and, and the thought came to me, John, are you praying incorrectly? Is this wrong? Is it wrong to say to God, God, if you don't speak to me, then just take me out? And so I was concerned about it. And a few hours later, I got on an airplane. And I just opened my Bible. Okay? I just opened it. And my eyes fell on Psalm 28, verse 1. Don't turn over there. Let me read it to you. David said, to you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Now listen to this. Do not be silent to me. Now listen. Lest, if you are silent to me, I become like, I become like those who go down to the pit. David said, God, if you don't talk to me, I'm no different than the sinner going to hell. 
See, David knew this. He understood this. This is why David spent so much time in communion with the Lord. But the thing was, David didn't have the Holy Spirit like we do. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was with the Old Testament believers. But he said he will be inside of you. When a person saved, the Spirit of God comes on them in order to give them the ability to confess Jesus as Christ, but he's not in them until they are baptized with him. That's when they're filled. And that's what happened in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, what did they do? They began to speak heavenly languages and earthly languages that spoke the wonderful praises of God. Languages they did not understand. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen? Now this morning I showed clearly because so many people today think that, you know, speaking in tongues isn't for everybody. Let me make this statement tonight. I'm going to make it as bold and loud and clear as possible. God's will is for every one of His children to speak in other tongues. It is God's will for them to be filled with the Spirit and speak with other tongues. You say, how do you know that? I know that because Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Are you a believer? Yes. I'm a believer. He said, in my name they will speak with new tongues. Paul said, by the Spirit of God, I wish that you all spoke with other tongues. That is the will of God. That's His desire. Now listen, I want to see it from the positive. Why do we look at things from the negative? Why do we try to reason out why we shouldn't speak in tongues? Or why it may have passed away? I showed clearly this morning it didn't pass away. Because Peter said the promise of the Father is to you, your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God, our, our God, will call. What was that promise? What you see and hear. They were speaking in tongues and prophesying. Peter said that's for everybody that calls upon the name of the Lord. Are you one of those people that are many and far off that have called upon the name of the Lord? Yeah. Come on, I didn't hear you. Yeah. Yes, then it's God's will for you to be filled. And the, what accompanies being filled is speaking with other tongues. Why do you want to speak in tongues? Why would a person want to speak in tongues? Well, let's talk about that. Go with me, please. To 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. Now, remember this morning I told you that there are four different kinds of tongues. Everybody say four different kinds of tongues. All right, let me review that quickly. Two are for public service. Everybody say two for public. Does everybody receive those gifts? No. God is, you know, not everybody's an apostle. Not everybody's a prophet. Not everybody's a teacher. Paul says this quite plainly in 1 Corinthians 12. Not everybody has got the gift for public service in, in massive congregations of the healings and miracles. And he said, do all speak in tongues? No, not all have the gift of being able to speak in other tongues publicly. Are you with me? All right? But it can happen at times. The gift of tongue can come on a person. But there is actually, I believe, an office that God calls. And I believe it's a part of the prophetic and part of the apostolic and other offices that people actually walk in that gifting as a regular part of the equipment of that office. I don't want to get into that. I'm not here to teach about that. But I'm here to say this morning that there are four different kinds of tongues that the New Testament talks about. Number one is what? The tongue of, uh, as a sign to the unbeliever. Correct? That is when somebody speaks in an earthly dialect they do not have any knowledge of. Number two is tongues for interpretation. That is when we are in assembly or in a, a gathering and a tongue is given and somebody interprets that heavenly language. It's not an earthly language, it's a heavenly language. The third tongue is what? Tongues for intercession. That is when we are praying and we go into groanings which cannot be uttered. Everybody say groanings. We'll talk about that maybe in a few minutes. And then the fourth is called what? Our personal prayer language that bedifies and builds us up. And that we're really going to talk about tonight. So tonight I really want to talk about why do we want to pray in tongues. Because folks, let me tell you something. It is an absolute vital part of our having intimacy with God. And I am believing that before you, you leave tonight, you're going to then understand why Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. Yeah. See, let me tell you something. Dr. David Cho, who has the, one of the largest churches in the world, 750,000 members. I've had the privilege of playing golf with him. I've spent time with him. When that man stepped into the car the first time when I was with him, it was like God walked into his, my car. I'm telling you, that man would walk into a room, the presence of God came in. 
And I have a very dear member of my board who is a, a pastor who has spent much time with him as well. And Dr. Cho will pray two, three hours a day in tongues. He prays two hours a day in, in Korea. He prays four hours a day when he's preaching in places like Japan. And he said about 80% of his prayer time is praying in tongues. And you're going to find out why tonight. Why does Paul say that I pray in tongues more than you all? I'm going to show you tonight. Amen? Because I'm telling you this is something that has been so attacked. You know, when I was done preaching this morning, Pastor Gail looked at me and she said, John, what a message. I said, Gail, it's not a message. It's a burden. And I know she was being so complimentary and being such a dear friend as she is to me and Bishop Jack is. But I said, Gail, this is more than a message to me. This is a burden because the enemy is trying to pull us back. Are you seeing this? He's trying to pull us back from the, one of the wonderful things that we receive as a result of Jesus shedding his blood. Amen? Amen. So number one reason, why do we want to speak in tongues? Number one. We can communicate with God on His level. Everybody say, communicate with God on His level. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Now, I said this this morning, I'm going to say it again. If I was to walk into the President of the United States office right now, he would have to come down to my level of communication. Isn't that right? Why? Because I do not know everything that's going on in this country like he does. I do not know the security codes. I do not know the things that are in place in the government that are top secret. He does. I don't. So when we communicate, he's got to come down to my level. Well, when we walk into the king of the universe's office, if we pray only in our intellect, if we pray only in our understanding, then the only level of intimacy and communication that we can have with God is on our level. God has made it so that we can come up to his level. Are you seeing this? That's why Paul says over here in verse 14, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is he saying? My spirit's praying, but my mind doesn't know what it's praying. Now, there's a lot of people that like to be in control. I know a man that will not get on an airplane. Want to know why? Because he's not in control. He's afraid of planes because he's not in control. But I said to him one day, laughing on the phone, I said, well, if you flew the plane, you'd probably go. He said, absolutely. Even though he doesn't know a thing about flying. I said, it's all a control thing, isn't it? He said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He kind of saw it. And there's people, let me tell you something. In our church today, they don't want to give up their mental control. They want to flow. Because Jesus said, everyone born of the spirits like the wind. You don't know where they're coming and you don't know where they're going. So they want control in their pulpits. They want to know exactly what they're going to say. They want to know every word. So they don't speak as the oracles of God. They speak their mental study. Their concordant speech. And so their words make you tired. But when somebody speaks by the Spirit of God, their words are spirit and their life. And you will notice that your heart will begin to burn when men and women begin to speak like that. You will say like the men and women on the road at Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus when they talked to Jesus, they said, they said, did not our heart burn within us? Are you seeing this? So notice what Paul goes on to say. He says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. In other words, I'll pray my mental, with my mental thinking ability. I'll speak in English. I'll pray in English, he's saying, and I'll pray in the spirit. He said, and also I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. Well, thank God we got great songs that are given to us today, like Darlene Check and all the other great worship leaders around the world and even our local worship leaders. And we have them up on there. And you know what? We can sing those. That's singing with the understanding. But you know what? He said, I also sing with the Spirit. <laughs> Last time I was here, if you remember, I was supposed to get up here and preach. And I just got up and the Spirit of God fell on me and I started singing. I can't sing and I can't hold a tune worth a lick when the Spirit of God's not on me. But when the Spirit of God comes on me like that, my kids will look at my wife and say, is that dad? Because they're in shock. Well, all of a sudden, I can sing. Are you with me? And if you remember, the presence of God at this place, and all of us begin to sing out of our spirits to the Lord. Do you remember that? Are you with me? Now, you, now that's singing in the, with the Spirit. Amen? So God's given us a way to come up to a higher level of worship, a higher level of what? Of communication and speaking. See, because why does God give us that? Because God wants to have intimacy with us on His level. Are you with me? Oh, it's so good. Reason number two 
It defeats our weakness of not knowing how or what to pray. Romans 8 verse 26 says, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress. What is our distress? For we don't even know what we should pray for, nor how we should pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Articulate speech in the original. Reason number two. It defeats our weakness of not knowing how or what we should pray. Listen, there's many times, folks, I don't know how to pray. I'm in a situation, I don't know how to pray. I said, Lord, I, I don't even know how to pray this one through. I need help, and I'll begin to pray in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me. And then, what I like to do is I say, now, Lord, give me the interpretation. So that sometimes He'll give me the wisdom, the way to pray it out loud in English. And that helps my understanding. And when my understanding gets that benefit, then it brings faith and stability. Are you with me? So many times when I pray in tongues, I say, Lord, let me interpret. What am I praying about? What are you praying through me right now? What are you giving me to pray? You see, I don't know what's happening with my mother right now in Florida. But the Spirit of God does. Suppose she needed. Suppose the enemy plotted a trick against her tonight and she needed prayer. God could wake me up and say, pray Pray for your mother. I don't know what's going on. I know what to do. I pray in the spirit because I don't know how to pray for her. I don't know what to pray for. I don't know what's going on. My mind does it. Are you seeing this? Now, this is the way God's given us as a church to be able to take care of the problems all over the world. Because the spirit of God knows what's going on. He's the one that searches the hearts. And he knows the situations. But if you read this verse of scripture, he goes on to say, he says, in groanings which cannot be uttered. Everybody say groanings. Now, I want to say something tonight. Sometimes when you go into prayer, your prayer language goes into a place where you can't even articulate the prayer language anymore. You literally go into a groaning place. Now, that's not something you just kind of manufacture. It just happens when your heart is so linked up with his and you are so burdened about something, you literally go into groanings. Now, I remember for years God was trying to move me into this. Now, this happens periodically with me when I'm out in my prayer closet. Something will be so heavy upon me that I'm praying in the Spirit and it just goes beyond that and I begin to groan. And let me tell you, I've seen some of the most powerful releases on that. I remember I was in a situation with a roommate years ago and I just couldn't figure out how to, how to pray about this thing because it was a very difficult situation. And I remember I went into groanings about this thing and listen, I had a release, I had joy, and you know within a couple weeks God straightened the whole thing out. You know, I've written this in my book, but what it was, this is back when I first got saved. My roommate was a homosexual, and I didn't know it. My dad warned me not to room with the guy, but I said, no, he's the praise and worship leader for the singles of our 8,000-member church. And something was severely wrong. And I went to my friends one night, and I said, i got to pray with you guys. Something's really wrong, because he kept bringing my car back at 8 o'clock in the morning filled with smoke. And one morning, there was a den on it. And one morning, I got up, and there was a guy sitting on my couch in my you know, two-bedroom apartment, and he was looking at me like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm live here. I live here. But the devil kept saying to me, walk in love, walk in love. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, we're not talking about the love of God. He was, the devil was just trying to say, oh, just ignore it. And I remember my friend, I went over to a friend's apartment. I was a Bible school student at the time. And we began to pray and all of a sudden groanings started coming out. Of deep, deep groanings. And all of a sudden I had joy. Within days I found out what he was doing. I'd have moved out within 12 hours. Unfortunately, he never repented and he died of AIDS in 1994 or 5. I hope he died on his deathbed. I don't know if he did or not. I just pray to God he did. But I remember that happened and I got away from it. How many of you know you can get away from things, folks? And so several years later, you know, when, about five or six years later, when I was already in the ministry, then God started dealing with me about that groaning again. And I remember one time, you know, it, it would come on me. Sometimes I'd come in prayer lines and that groaning and I'd suppress it. Are you with me? So one time, my, my wife's mother, my mother-in-law, was at our house for Christmas. And I remember coming in from the office one night. Lisa had not come home yet. And I came in, and there is my mother crawling up the stairs. And I looked at my mother-in-law. I said, what's wrong? And she turned around, and she looked at me. She had this just terrible white look on her face, pale. She said, oh, John, I've never been this sick in my life. Now, let me tell you something. She's a woman who got healed of cancer. So when she said, I've been this sick in my life, she said, I have never had the flu like this in my life. She said, I don't even know if I've got the strength to get up these stairs. I said, come here, let me pray for you. She said, absolutely. She said, so she came down. And I remember I started to pray, and all of a sudden, that hit again. That groaning. And I thought, oh, well, it's just my mother-in-law. I might as well let it come out. 
She probably, she thinks I'm already crazy, so why not? <laughs> Which she doesn't. She doesn't. She loves me. And I remember I began to groan, and I had my eyes closed because I didn't want to see her face. <laughs> and this groaning, almost like a woman giving birth, was coming deep from my spirit. And all of a sudden, next thing I know, I don't feel her anymore. And I hear a thud. And I look down, and she's on the floor, gone. And I think, oh boy, what's going on here? And so all of a sudden, she starts stirring, and I pick her up, and she jumps up and goes, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Now listen, she starts running around the house. My wife comes in right as she was falling over. Now my wife's looking at me like, what are you doing to my mother? But when my wife saw her jump up and go, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, my wife was excited. And you know what she did? She was so happy, she cooked my wife and I dinner. And then I thought about it. I thought, wow, well, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law one time. And as soon as he healed her, she got up and cooked him dinner. I thought, isn't that cool? But I didn't, I didn't know how to pray for her in English. And that groaning came. Are you seeing this? Oh, I tell you, it just makes me so excited. I can hardly stand it. Reason number three. Everybody say reason number three. It strengthens our faith. Everybody say it strengthens our faith. Jude 20, write it down. I don't want to turn there for the sake of time. It says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. When we pray in the Spirit, it builds our faith. Oh, man, I'll tell you, there are times when I'm in distressful situations and I'll just start praying in the Holy Spirit. And I'll just begin to pray and all of a sudden I notice, man, the faith has increased. Sometimes you don't sense it. You may feel like, man, I just prayed, my throat's dry, I've been praying for an hour this way, but then you go into a meeting, all of a sudden, bam! Or you go into this situation that's difficult, and all of a sudden you go, bam, there's faith. Are you seeing this? It literally builds your faith. That's why the enemy wants to stop you from praying in tongues. He's arguing with your mind, saying, you're not getting anywhere with this. Why? Your mind is unfruitful. Now, there are ways to make it fruitful, and I'll get to that later. All right? Amen? All right, that's reason number three. Reason number four, are you enjoying this? Yeah. All right, it gives us the ability to worship and give thanks at a higher level. Paul says, I just read it early in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 through 17. Read it with me. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will also sing with the spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies a place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? Verse 17, for you indeed give thanks well. Everybody say you give thanks well. So you know what? You know when you don't really feel it coming from your heart, the praise? Now you can do it in English, but sometimes what I do is I'll just start worshiping God in the Spirit. And what you're doing is giving perfect thanks. You're thanking God at a higher level. Holy Spirit, I'm so in love with God. I'm so in love with my Father. So in love with Jesus. I'm so in love with you. But I can't seem to get the right words out right now. Help me. And you just go into the Spirit. Oh, it's beautiful. Amen. All right, reason number five. Everybody say reason number five. It reveals... Oh, this is one of my favorites. You ready? Now I'm going to take time on this one. It reveals the hidden counsel of God. The mysteries, the council. Everybody say the council. Or the mysteries. Oh, I'm, I'm going to take time on this one. Can, will, you, will you give me some time? Go with me to Proverbs chapter 20. Oh, gosh. You got to see this. Proverbs 20. We're going to do a little, 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 little scripture run in here. Proverbs the 20th chapter. I've got them written down. I could quote them to you, but I just don't. I want you to see this. Proverbs 20, verse 5. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Counsel. Everybody say counsel. counsel. Now look up at me, please. Why do people go to pastors for counseling appointments? What do they need? Help, advice, what to do. Correct? Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water. God says, in your heart... It's all the counsel you'll ever need. Why? Because the counselor is there. It's like deep water. Look at this. But, everybody say but. A man or a woman of understanding will draw it out. Everybody say counsel. In the heart of a man. 
in my heart is like deep water. But the man of understanding knows how to draw it out. How does he draw it out? Go to John chapter 7. John 7 verse 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Remember, counsel in the heart of a man. Are you getting this? Counsel in the heart of a man. It's his deep waters. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. I want to look at the sixth verse. However, we speak wisdom. Wisdom and counsel are very similar, right? However, we speak wisdom or counsel among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Everybody say in a mystery. Yes. The hidden wisdom which was ordained before the ages for our glory. Verse 9. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered the heart of a man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, just the deep things of God. Everybody say deep things. Deep things. All right, now watch this. For what man knows the things of a man, except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. The Spirit who is from God knows the deep things of God, right? that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Verse 13, these things we speak, not in words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Are you seeing this? Look at verse 7 again. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. I'm going to say mystery. Now listen to me. This is a twofold application here. How many of you know that there are mysteries sometimes that we need to solve? The will of God sometimes can appear to us to be a mystery. Why? I can't read in chapter and verse the girl I'm supposed to marry. I can't read in chapter and verse the place I'm supposed to go preach next week. I can't read in chapter and verse, are you listening to me, the business deal that i got to make next week. That's counsel. And that counsel right now is, is a mystery to the natural mind. It is mystery. Are you with me? But look at 1 Corinthians 14. <laughs> Look at this. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 2. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. The Spirit of God, right? He knows the deep things, right? For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Are you getting this? Folks, let me tell you something. This works twofold. In the counsel you need in your life and as far as the mysteries of God. Let me give you an example of counsel. I'm asked to preach in Monterey, Mexico. Monterey, Mexico, I think is third or fourth largest city in Mexico. I fly down there. Okay, our ministry covers the expense. When I get down there, I'm excited. Because this pastor is holding a meeting in, the, in, in a big gymnasium right in downtown Monterey. He advertises me as an internationally known uh, speaker. Big mistake. I get to the meeting. It's exciting. I've prayed all day. I'm ready. And 15 minutes before the meeting, in comes a governmental official with two armed soldiers. He finds out who's the leader of the meeting. He goes over to the pastor, and I see this at a distance. And he is speaking to him in a very, very mean look. With a mean look, and it doesn't look like a very kind tone because it's all Spanish. All right? I don't understand this. And so the pastor comes over to me and says, John, it looks like you're not going to be able to speak tonight. I said, what? He said, John, he's a high-ranking government official in this city. And he said, there is a fine law. What he means by a fine print law that says that only people that can preach in Mexico are Mexican citizens. He said nobody ever enforces it, but people, if they want to be hard, difficult, can do it. 
and he's doing it. I said, wait a minute. I said, I didn't come down here, fly down here not to preach. He said, John, this could have some serious repercussions. I said, look, are you concerned about your church? I said, if you are, then I, I, I will submit to this. I said, but if you're not, I said, if you're just concerned about me, I'm preaching. I said, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be denied to preach the gospel. Amen. And he looked at me and he said, this could really have bad implications in my church because he was an American missionary who was married to a Mexican citizen. I said, all right, I submit. So now I'm furious. I am furious. And I said, God, I don't know what to do now. So I walk over there with this guy, and the man looks at me, and he's very, very mean as far as the way he's looking at me. And he says, do you speak Spanish? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, I have one thing to say to you. I said, what is it? He said, you will say nothing to these people except tourist-related activities. And then he turns to the pastor and starts speaking some more in Spanish to him. So the pastor pulls me away and says, John, you can't preach. So I'm furious. The service starts. I go outside I, because there's no place to, to pray down there. I mean, they're crowded. So I walk outside, and there's a flagpole and a bed of flowers right in front of the gymnasium, the, the, the complex. It's a big multi-complex. It's not just a gym. It's a multi-complex thing. It's an auditorium gym, all this other stuff. And I just start walking around the flagpole praying in tongues. I said, I don't care what people think. They'll probably think I'm a crazy Frenchman, but I got, I got some business here to take care of. So I just start walking around the flagpole. I said, Holy Spirit, I need counsel. I don't know what to do. I said, I don't even know what to think, what to do, or anything. I said, you didn't send me down here to, to fly home and do nothing. So I just start praying in tongues. And while I'm praying in tongues, I'm saying, Lord, speak to me. I pray that I can interpret what you're praying. I hear this bubble up from here. You know how God speaks to you. You don't hear it here. You feel it bubble up here, and you, listen, you get it here. And I hear this thought bubble up from deep within my being. Put away your Bible. And tell them about the greatest tourist that's ever visited Mexico, Jesus. I said, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. So I run back in and he lets me preach. So I preach that night for about an hour. And when I get done, I give the invitation and, you know, people come down. A lot of people come down. And all of a sudden, here comes a policeman walking right towards the, uh, the, the platform. I said, man, they're going to arrest me. I got to get these people saved before they arrest me. <laughs> so I said, everybody, bye. And I prayed the prayer. And when I, when I was done, I opened up my eye, and the policeman went into the curtain behind me. And I thought, wow, he didn't arrest me. Good. So then the people start walking off, and there's a crippled man. The Lord speaks to me. He says, that's the first one I'm going to heal. And, that, and so I laid my hands on this guy, and I prayed. I said, Lord, that these people might know that you have raised from the dead and that you love them and died for their sins. I said, I thank you for healing this man tonight. And I said, give me your walking instruments. I said, throw them away. He looked at me like, what? I said, get rid of your walking instruments. My interpreter said it to him. He said, I said, now give me your hand. So we start walking. He's going like this. I said, come on, walk. And he starts going like this. Then we start going like this. He starts walking like this. And then I start doing this. And he starts doing this. He starts doing this. The place went crazy. Okay? Now everybody's running down. Okay? And we have total chaos. Okay? These are Hispanic people, okay? They are not waiting for an invitation now. They are coming down to get. And that's good. And so I'm losing my voice. My pastor's over there. I'm, and, and, and God, I mean, opened up the ears of a woman that night. And literally, listen, when he, she had been deaf in her ear since birth, totally deaf in this ear and 75% deaf in that ear. When God opened her ears, that woman cried so much, her light blue blouse became dark blue from all the tears. I mean, it's amazing. Then the Lord healed a woman of eyesight. Another person got healed. Then this five-year-old boy got healed. Now, I get on the plane and I fly out. I think, thank God, I got out of here, okay? I also noticed that there was people taking pictures. One week later, the pastor flies up to America and he says, I got to meet with you. I said, sure. He sits down. He shows me the front page of the Monterey newspaper. How that the government said I was a fraud and taking money out. I didn't take any. You know what? The Lord led me not to take an offering out of that. That was what was so amazing. He said, but the paper said we were there and we saw people getting healed. He said, but John, this is what I got to tell you. The guy, the high government official, sent two undercover policemen back that night to arrest you if you preached. He said, they got there right as you were given the invitation for people to come and get saved. So he said, the one looked at the other and said, well, let's watch this guy for a few minutes. He says, the reason I know this is my ushers were hearing him. He said, when they saw the crippled man get healed, the one looked at the other and said, do you think this is real? The other said, I don't know. Let's go closer and look. He said, so they came in closer. 
to see what was happening because it was so chaotic down in the front. He said they saw the woman get healed and they commented on that. They said, God, this, this. then they saw the little five-year-old boy go out under the power of God, rise up healed. And when the little five-year-old boy got healed, the one looked at the other and said, this is real. And the two guys that came to arrest you ended up getting saved and you prayed for them to get saved. Now, if I didn't have the counsel, I would have went home and we wouldn't have had a meeting. Are you getting this? See, folks, you have to understand something. He says, counsel, the wisdom, the mysteries, the wisdom of God is hidden. Are you with me? But the Spirit of God makes it known. Are you getting this? Now, listen, as an author, how many of you know I've written books? Let me see your hands, okay? As an author, I cannot tell you how many times I have come to a place where I've hit a dead end in my books. Are you with me? I just go, I, I, just, I just hit a wall. And you know what I do? I get up in my hotel room and I start praying in tongues. And you know what happens? All of a sudden, stuff, not stuff, wisdom starts bubbling up in me. I run over the computer and I jump down and I type as fast as I can and I just go for another couple of chapters. That has happened so many times. You know where a lot of these messages that I preach have come from? Just praying in tongues. And the wisdom of God comes up. This is why many times people will look at me and say, man, you must spend hours in study. No, I got the teacher living on the inside of me. Now, don't get me wrong. I love to study and I spend a lot of time in the scriptures. Because, you know, every time I read the scriptures, I'm not looking for a message. I'm reading the scriptures because I'm saying, Lord, I want to see Jesus. That's the way I read the scriptures. I'm not looking for a message. I'm looking for him. Are you seeing this? Oh, I tell you, I can preach and preach and preach on this one. See, you may not know how to talk to your children. You may not know how to deal with the situation in your home. Just start praying in tongues. Say, Lord, I need counsel. And all of a sudden, just pray. Well, as you're praying, the Bible says, let him who speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he interpret. Say, Lord, I need the interpretation. Show me what to say. If you do this, architect, you'd have the greatest architectural designs. If you did this, engineer, you'd have the greatest designs. If you did this, businessman, you would be making the smartest deals. Listen, Daniel lived in Babylon, and he was the smartest guy in the whole place. And he was a Hebrew. Why was he the smartest guy? Because he prayed three times a day. And if he could do it without the Holy Spirit, what do you think we can do with the Holy Spirit praying in tongues? That's why you should be the very best in whatever area God's got you. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. You got a bunch of people bidding against you? Start praying in tongues. He'll give you a good idea. Oh, gosh. Oh, hallelujah. Sixth reason. Come on now, are you with me? Come on, stay with me tonight. Sixth reason, it gives us rest. Seventh reason, it brings refreshing. How do I know that? Go with me to 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 21. Well, you know what? It's all so good. Verse 20. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, watch this, in malice be babies. But in understanding be mature. How can he say that? Because you've got the Spirit of God and he reveals the deep things of God. Now watch this. Verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, they do not hear me. Now, where is that recorded? Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. Now, if we were to turn over there, I'm going to read it to you because I've got written down. Everybody say Isaiah 28, Isaiah 28. verse 11 and 12. If you read that in context, you know what? You'd be finding out that God's talking about the Babylonian, the Syrian army that's going to come against Israel and he's going to speak to them through a foreign language. Now, there's a lot of people that say, you know, you preachers, you sometimes take scriptures out of context. If you read the way Paul and Matthew quoted Old Testament scriptures, those same guys would say Paul and Matthew misquoted him too. Because what people don't understand is that many times in Old Testament prophecies, yes, there is an Israeli or a Jewish prophetic fulfillment, but many times there is a church fulfillment. And that is why Paul is quoting here actually what was spoken to them about the Babylonians. He's actually quoting to us. But listen to what he says in Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. 
to whom he said, this is the rest. This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. So now, isn't this interesting? He's talking about Israel not hearing, not submitting to the Babylonian captivity. But yet he's also speaking to the New Testament believers saying, with stammering lips and other tongues, I'll speak to this people. And this is the rest and this is the refreshing. See, repent and turn to the Lord. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Who's the presence of the Lord? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm preaching myself happy right now. Yeah. Do you know what? So many times I feel beat up. Do you know what I'm talking about? Does anybody relate? How many of you know we're in a war? And sometimes you feel a little weary, just a little tired. You know what I do? I start praying in tongues. And all of a sudden, I'm refreshed. Here comes the rest that I need. My soul quiets down. If you pray in tongues long enough, your soul will quiet down. That's why your aids are able to easily hear from God. Because praying in tongues will quiet your mental screaming, your soul. When you persevere, are you with me? That will bring rest to your soul. That's one of the ways. Other ways are worship. Other ways are just, you know, I mean, there's various ways, but this is one of the ways. So everybody say, gives us rest, brings refreshing. Now, the last point I want to make tonight, and this is where I'm going to conclude, because it's one of the best. When we pray in tongues, it edifies or builds up our spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4. We've read it many times. Let's read it again. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Everybody say edifies. edifies. Jude says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, the word edifies here means this. It is the Greek word. I'm not even going to pronounce it because I can't do it. But it means this, to build a house or an edifice. An edifice is described in the, in the Webster's Dictionary as a large or massive structure. Are you getting this? Now, in the scripture, it's used metaphorically in the sense of promoting spiritual growth and developing our character. When he who prays an unknown tongue builds himself up, what is he doing? He's building within his spirit the capacity of holding the power of God and the presence of God. It increases. That's why it says building yourselves up on your most holy face. It increases your capacity to walk in his power. Oh, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Now, how do we become, listen, more, listen, more sensitive and, and able to walk in His power? I'm going to tell you how, by becoming more sensitive to Him. Because not, it's not a mechanic thing, it's a relational thing. And faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Not, a, listen, a textbook message. It is the Spirit of God speaking to our spirit. So what praying in tongues does is strengthens your inner man to be able to contain what the Holy Spirit has because of your submission and your obedience to Him. Power comes when we obey, folks. Are you with me? So now listen, in order to describe this, we've got to go to Hebrews. Now remember, this is the last point I'm making, but boy, it's a good one. Don't miss it. Go to the book of Hebrews. Are you getting something out of this tonight? Am I developing a desire for you to have intimacy with God? That wasn't good enough. Yeah. All right, that's good. Hebrews, the sixth, fifth chapter, please. Hebrews chapter five. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm so excited. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Paul says, and I just want to read all of this, okay? Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up, this is verse seven, when he had offered up prayers, everybody say prayers, and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Everybody say heard. The word heard is the Greek word, which means this, to hear so as to answer. I may be able to hear you, but when I hear you to answer you, that's another situation. All right? Are you with me? Though he was the son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Okay? He goes on to say, called by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Right? Verse 11, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain. Why? Since you have become, become dull of hearing. Does everybody see that? 
Paul says you become dull of hearing. Now, he's not saying that all these guys needed hearing aids. He's talking about their spirits, their hearts. What a lot of people do not understand is that you have five spiritual senses just like you have five physical senses. Folks, this earth, this, this body is your earth suit. This body is made in the image of your spirit. Your spirit has five senses just like your body does because your spirit is you. Are you with me? I said, are you with me? Now, 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 some of you may not know this. Let me just read you some scriptures. Let's talk about taste. All right? Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How are you going to taste God? It's not talking about this taste. It's talking about tasting God in your spirit. Oh. Psalm 119, verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey in my mouth. So David talks about his physical sense, honey in my mouth, and his spiritual sense of taste. Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found, I ate them, and your word was me to the joy and the rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name. He said, I ate your word. It was delicious. It was joyful. Everybody say touch. touch. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Is he saying don't touch a sinner? You might get what he's got. No, he's not talking about physical touch. He's talking about don't touch what they touch in the realm of the Spirit. Isaiah 52, 11, depart, go out from there. Do not touch an unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her, be clean. You who bear the vessels of the Lord. Touch again. Everybody say smell. smell. Listen to me. Jeremiah 48, verse 11. God says, Moab has been at ease from his youth. Therefore, his taste remained in him and his scent has not changed. His scent has not changed. So I can walk into spiritual, or in, 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 into atmospheres and sense spiritual climates. You can preach repentance to a church and everybody, everything gets cleaned up and all of a sudden the smell of the atmosphere, the spiritual atmosphere is better. I know ministers that said they have smelled homosexual devils. And they said it's one of the nastiest things they've ever smelled before because God opened up their sense of smell. Second Corinthians, it didn't say the person was a nasty smelling thing. It's the spirit, the sin. Second Corinthians, but if the person hangs on to it, guess what? 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance. Remember, we're talking about smell. The fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, an aroma of life leading to life. So he says, we're an aroma. Are you seeing this? Ephesians 5, verse 2, And walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling aroma. Listen, Calvary was a sweet-smelling aroma to God. Certainly wasn't in the natural, because whenever you have blood and people being put to death like that, it's a nasty smell. But God said it was a sweet smell. When Noah offered up the burnt sacrifice after the flood, God said it's a sweet-smelling aroma. I'll never cover the water, earth with water again. Those animals weren't make, making a sweet smell with your natural sense. Are you seeing this? I could go on and on. Let's talk about sight. Ephesians 1.18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling. He's not talking about these eyes. He's talking about these eyes. Matthew 6.22 and 23. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. He's talking about the eye of the heart. Romans 3.18 says there's no fear of God in their eyes. He's talking about their spirits. 2 Peter 2.14. Having eyes full of adultery. He talks about sin. People that are bound to sin. Having eyes full of adultery. Hearing. Watch this, 1 Kings 18, 41 through 42. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go up and drink for there's a sound of the abundance of rain. Listen, it hadn't rained for three and a half years and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And Elijah had to go up and pray on the mountain seven times with his head between his legs. And then his servant saw just one little cloud and Elijah said, get going because here it comes. But he said to King Ahab before he ever prayed the seven times, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. He's hearing with his inner ears. Are you seeing this? Why? Because his inner senses are sensitive. Are you seeing this? Luke 14, verse 35. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He wasn't talking about these ears. He was talking about these ears, right? Revelations 2, 7. He who has an ear, hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. So do you see that there are five spiritual senses, folks? Now look at this. Keep going here. Verse 12. For this, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be mature. He said, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for his baby. Now listen carefully. Are you ready for this? But solid food belongs to those who are full age. Everybody say full age. Full age. Mature. Okay. That is those 
who by reason of use, the margin says practice, those who by reason of practice have their senses exercised. These senses, not the outer sentences, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now look, look up at me. I'm an athlete, but let me relate to you from other people's perspective. I can show you these guys that takes 200 sips of wine a day. What have they done? They've trained their sense of taste. They can tell you if it was an early crop or a late crop. They can tell you how much rain they had that year or how dry it was. They can tell you all about what's in that wine because they have trained their senses. I can show you other guys and ladies. They'll smell hundreds of perfumes. They'll tell you everything that's in that perfume. They have their senses trained. I can show you jewelers who can take one look at what you think is your beautiful engagement ring and go, flaws everywhere. They can take a look at one diamond that you think is a diamond and say, phony. Their eye is trained. Who by reason of practice. Now, I was an athlete. I played varsity tennis at Purdue. I played Junior Davis Cup in the USTA circuit. I played five to six hours a day. My mom threatened to move my bed down to the court. When I got saved, thank God I got delivered from it because it was an idol in my life. But what would I do? I'd run every morning at six o'clock. We'd go down to the court before I would teach as a teaching pro, and we'd do down the line forehands, down the line backhands. We'd do approach shots, down the line approach shots, cross court, approach shots, backhand down the line. We'd do overheads, 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 overheads. We'd do serve, 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 serve. What am I doing? I'm training my senses so that when I'm in the match, I'm doing things without even thinking about it. Do you remember when you first started dressing when you were a little kid? It took you a half an hour to button your shirt. But now, what about it today? You got the coffee, cup of coffee and the phone like this and you button the shirt without even thinking about it. You've trained yourself. Are you with me? Paul is saying that the mature ones are those who by reason of practice That's good. Thank you. That's have trained their senses to discern through exercise, 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 over and over and over and over and over to discern both good and evil. So what do I do? I pray in tongues, and I'm looking for what the Spirit of God's saying to me. The Spirit of God has spoken to me before, and I've done what He's told me to do, and it's been right. And what does it do? It builds me. So what happens is this, folks. When your senses are extremely sensitive, you can communicate better. Let me put it to you in an extreme measure. If you can't see, just think about it physically. If you cannot see, you cannot touch, you cannot smell, you cannot taste, and you cannot hear. If all five of your senses are dull and don't work, guess what? I can't communicate with you. Because if I jump, you can't see me. If I touch you and say, hey, you can't feel it. If I scream and go, listen, I got something to say, you can't hear me. I can't put something in your mouth to get your attention because you can't taste it. I can't put something under your nose because you can't smell it. I cannot communicate with you. Now listen carefully to me. The Bible says the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. The Holy Spirit does not communicate to our heads. Where He speaks, where He enlightens, where He illuminates is in our spirit. So if your spiritual senses are keen, He can speak with you more freely. But here's why so many people say to me all the time, I don't hear from God. I never hear anything from God. Well, He doesn't talk to me. Well, guess what? He sure would like to because you know why? He has so much to say. But you know what? Your senses are dull. He has much to say, but hard to explain since you become dull, he says. See, my dad used to be the sharpest guy I ever knew. Sharp as a tack. Engineer for 40 years with DuPont. But now he's 83 and he's losing his hearing. And the last time we were together, we we're sitting there having a conversation, talking away, and he's in another world. He didn't get any of the... We'd have to yell and say, did you get that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah. Huh. But he didn't hear a thing we said. That's just his hearing. And you see what happens is people aren't praying in tongues. They're not building up their senses. I'm constantly looking in here. When I walk into churches, I don't look at how nice they are. They may give me a nice fruit basket. They may be nice. They may smile. They may say, oh, we're so glad you're here. But inside, everything's going, nye, 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 rebellion. Nye, nye, nye. And I'm going, oh, boy, there's stuff here we got to deal with. So I don't come here based on how nice you are to me. I come here based on what I'm getting in my spirit. Why? Because I've been going to churches for 13 years and conferences all over the world. And I've learned about spiritual climates and atmospheres in churches. 
And I can walk in and sense a rebellious spirit like that, a spirit of Jezebel like that, an intimidating spirit like that. Why? Because I've had to fight him so much in the last 20 years. My senses have been discerned, my exercise to discern both good and evil. I can walk right up to a person and start talking to them, and within one minute, no, that's a spiritual man, that's a spiritual woman. Yet I've only known them for one minute. Why? Because I know them. I'm discerning them by the Spirit. That doesn't mean I'm being critical. It just means I know where they're at. So when you become mature, you know what to do. I remember when I was a youth pastor, I walked in the grocery store one night, and there was one of the kids in my youth group. He went, Pastor John, Pastor John. And as soon as I saw him, I said, Spirit of the world and Spirit of lust. But you know what? There was no umption to say anything. See, that's maturity. You can sense something, but the greatest maturity comes, what do you want me to do, Holy Spirit? Shut up. I'm just showing you something. Because there's no unction. You don't speak unless the unction's there. So I just looked at him. I said, nice to see you. I was nice. Smiled. Walked away. One month later, he's got an appointment with me. He comes into my office. And we're talking away. And after about 30 minutes of us just talking, the unction came. Say what you saw a month ago. So I looked at him. I said, you know when you were in the grocery store a month ago? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, I saw the spirit of the world and the spirit of lust all over you. And it was like an arrow hit him just like that. He went, ugh. Well, you know what happened? The next hour, he got delivered from homosexuality. And he got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know if he was saved or not, but he was saved when he left the office. He may have been saved and down. I don't know. But you know what? He got married. I had the privilege of marrying him, I think. But you see what I'm saying? You know, people that learn to live in the Spirit are free. If you are led by the Spirit, you're no longer under the law, Paul says. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? See, the Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. Not everybody's led by the Spirit. You have to look at the word sons. The word sons there is the Greek word weos. There are two Greek words, major Greek words, that are used as translated sons in the New Testament. Weos and technon. Technon means you're a son by mere fact of birth. John 1.12, for as many as receive him, they gave the power to become the sons of God. Right? By mere fact of birth, they're a child of God. It's like when my son Addison was born. You walk into the hospital, you look into the nursery, you can't tell my baby from any of them. They all look alike except for the, the, the African-American ones, okay, or the Chinese ones. All the Caucasian ones look like this the same to me. But I saw a little sign above my son's crib that said Bevere. I said, that's my boy. Now, he's my boy by mere fact of birth. He came out of Lisa, right? But now, listen, he's 16 now, and he's so much like me, it frustrates me to no end. I think, poor boy, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. My mom looked at me and said, so much like you. She said, it's scary. He does things you used to do that you don't even do anymore. I said, oh, my, my. Now, what's happening? Weos means this. A son that can be told he is a son by the fact that he imitates the character of his father. That's good. Or his mother. That's good. You can tell Addison Bevere is my boy, not by, not by mere fact of birth, but because he's got my character. Are you getting this? For his maids are led by the Spirit. These are the mature sons of God. Now, then Paul goes on to say the mature ones are not under the law. Now, I find it interesting that Paul writes to the Corinthian church two letters. They're, listen, they got gifts, they believe in gifts, but you know what? They're immature. He's got to deal with them about suing each other. He's got to deal with them about their sexual immorality. He's got to deal with them all about their sin, their strife, their division, their jealousies. And then he comes to the very end of the second letter and the very last verse. He says, may the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. In other words, if you would just fall in love with the Holy Spirit, and walk with him, you wouldn't have sexual problems. You wouldn't have suing problems. You wouldn't have division problems. Want to know why? Because you become like the ones you hang around with. Psychologists say this, the relationships and friendships we have for the past five years of our life develop our personalities. Did you hear what I said? The relationships we have for the last five years of our life develop our personalities. Now listen, David's hanging around with a bunch of disgruntled, angry, confused, offended men. That's all, that's his whole world for 14 years. But yet he remains a prince. Why? Because he spent two, listen, he spent most of his time with the Lord. He stayed a king and brought them up to his level. And then those the men became some of the most renowned men in the Bible. Because he stayed with the king. And he influenced them. That's what, that, that, that's what Paul means. That's why he says this Corinthian church, I wouldn't have to write you all these regulations and guidelines if you just hang with the Holy Spirit. 
then you wouldn't be under these regulations, this law. Whoever is led by the Spirit is not under the regulations and all the other stuff. I wouldn't have to write to you about not having sexual immorality, not doing this and not doing that and not doing this because you're having such, such intimacy with Him. When you have intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Listen, the last thing in the world you'd ever want to do is jump into bed with some strange chick or look at some girl showing off her dirt. Are you seeing this? Are you with me? Nobody has to tell you what movie to watch. Nobody has to tell you the kind of friends to pick. Because you're doing everything to protect and to guard that relationship that you have with the one you're so in love with. I want this on record. I love him more than anyone on the entire planet. I love him more than my wife. I love him more than my children. I love him more than my very best friends that are on this earth. He's my best friend. I hope I'm one of his good friends. But I know as far as he goes, he is the one. Take everybody, everything away. You keep, listen, just give me him and I'm fine. He's all I need. I never, 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 never have problems with hotel rooms. Do you know I am in, listen, hundreds of hotel rooms. I never have problems. They say, do you want to go tour this? Do you want to go see that? I'm in some of the most famous cities in the world. Do you want to see this? Well, okay. Nah, not really. Why? Because I want to spend time with him. Right. I never, ever have problems with loneliness. Because I've learned to commune with him. Sometimes he draws back a little and says, come on, persist. And that's when a lot of people give up. The only reason God draws back from you is just to get you more hungry for him. It's like the Song of Solomon. He comes knocking at the door. And she delays a little. Finally, when she comes, he's not there. And she runs through the city. Have you seen my beloved? And he's just watching her run all over the place. Because he's saying, I'm just getting you a little bit more hungry for me. So it's not him rejecting you. If there's sin in your life, get rid of it. That's, that's a wall between you and him, okay? Get rid of that. But if you're walking in obedience and you feel like he's pulled back, he's just saying, chase me. Chase me. Let's have some fun. Chase me. Come on. I want you to be hungry because if you're hungry, I can feel you more. Yes. So, let me end it with this tonight. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? Jesus said you ask the Heavenly Father for the Holy Spirit. He's not going to give you a different spirit. He said if a son asks the Father for a fish, he's not going to give him a scorpion. He's not going to, if he asks him for an egg, he's not going to give him a snake. He said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them to ask Him? In other words, what he's saying is, if you ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, He's not going to give you a devil. He's not going to give you a different spirit. He's not even going to give you an angel. I'm not talking about an angel of heaven. He says, I'm going to give you my spirit. He didn't even entrust us with, with an angel. You just ask. How did it happen in the book of Acts? They asked, and the apostles laid hands upon them. And when they did... They began to speak with other tongues as they were filled. Now listen, the Bible says they spoke with tongues. Everybody say, they, they spoke with tongues. The Holy Spirit didn't come on them and rattle their mouth. You have to speak as the Spirit gives you utterance. But I don't understand. You don't understand. Your mind doesn't understand a thing you're saying. It may sound like gibberish to you, but you just yield. Everybody say, yield. You know, I can stand in a river, and the river can be a rapid flowing river, and I can just stand there. Or if I'm smart, I'll just jump in. Now, you know what happens to people many times? They pray to get the Holy Spirit, and they stand in the river, unfortunately. And they go, well, it doesn't work. Yes, it works, because God says, if you ask me, I'll give them. Now, God is not a liar, and I'm going to believe God, not you. Now, unfortunately, when I prayed for my wife to receive the Holy Spirit, she didn't pray at first. And then two weeks later, we were at a prayer meeting. I said, Lisa, speak. I said, you know what? It's a river. You're only seeing the tip of the river. You may have one syllable that's floating up from your spirit. Just speak that. It's like a spool of thread. Oh, it will come. And all of a sudden, she starts speaking. She said, that syllable's been running around in my head for two weeks. I said, that's right, because you got filled two weeks ago. I said, but you were standing in the river. And tonight, you just yielded. But that's what it's like. You see it as a spool of thread in your gut, and you only see one tip. You may see one syllable. It may be a stammering lip. But then as it comes, you learn how to yield better and better and better to where it becomes many languages. I've had many languages come out of my mouth. Sometimes they're oriental sounding. Most of the times they're heavenly sounding. And I remember the thing that convinced me the most. I'd just gotten filled with the Holy Spirit back in 1980, back in 1979. 
And one of my dear friends that I worked with, who was a saved man who went to a denomination that didn't believe in the Holy Spirit baptism, he said, John, it's of the devil. So I was fighting this. He said, this is the devil. You need to stop this. And so I remember I went to my little church, and there was a man there from Ireland. And all of us men stood outside the back of the church, and we started praying. And they all started praying in the Spirit, and I thought, I'm just going to listen. And when I listened, the guy from Ireland, standing right next to me, that I had my hand in, spoke exactly what I had been speaking. His tongue sounded just like what God had given me. And I went, it's real. He's from the other side of the earth. And yet he's speaking almost exactly the way the Spirit of God gives it to me. Because when you get really sensitive to this, you'll notice the diverse tongues. Paul talks about speaking with the tongues of angels. I've been in meetings before where I am aware the Holy Spirit in me is giving instructions to angels. You don't give interpretation to that, folks. Because I've had intercessors come up to me. I knew it was happening. They come up to me and they said, we saw myriads of angels around this building while you were speaking in those tongues. I said, I know. I said, because the Holy Spirit showed me he was speaking through this earth pot, his instruction for the me, and then all of a sudden the power hits. People are getting saved and healed and delivered. Now listen to me. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit before, or you've tried, never try. God says you can never get anything from me by trying. He said the only thing you can get from me is through faith. Faith means I know you. See, see if my little boy, my eight-year-old precious little boy, if I said to my little boy, I'm going to bring you a present home from this trip, and the whole time he's going, well, I don't know. I sure hope he brings a present. You know, Mom, I don't know if Dad's going to do it. What is he doing? He's questioning my integrity. And that hurts as a father. Well, when you go, well, I sure hope you give it to me, God. No, you've just, caught, you've just questioned the integrity of God. Because God said, if you ask me, I will give him to you. There's only one requirement. He gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. All you have to do is in your heart obey and say, Lord, if there's sin, disobedience in your life, forgive me. I repent of it. Now, Lord, I want your spirit. First thing is you have to be born again. You have to give your life totally to Jesus. Then you ask. And when you ask, you receive. And listen, when you receive, you have to speak. It's not the Holy Spirit that will take you and shake you and make you speak. The Bible is very specific about that. What happens? We have to yield to him. And let me say this to you. You cannot speak tongues and English at the same time. I cannot speak to you Spanish and English at the same time. I cannot speak in English and tongues at the same time. So this is what people do. They go, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, how in the world are you ever going to yield to the Holy Spirit when you're speaking your English? Are you with me? Amen. Have you been filled since you believed? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? I said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? If not, and you'd say, Jesus is my Lord, or I want to receive him as my Lord right now, and I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit because I want intimacy with God, and I want to walk in the deeper things of God, then stand up right now. This life-empowering message is a presentation of Messenger International. We want to stay in touch with you. Visit us on the web at messengerinternational.org and request the Messenger newsletter. It contains timely articles, powerful testimonies, outreach programs, and John and Lisa's current itinerary. Log on and receive our free catalog. It features our extensive collection of books, curriculums, interactive DVDs, CDs, and audio and video tapes. Be a part of what Messenger International is doing. We'd love to hear your testimony, and if you want information on partnership, please contact us. In America, write to our world headquarters at Messenger International, P.O. Box 888, Palmer Lake, Colorado, 80133. Toll free, 1-800-648-1477. In the United Kingdom, write P.O. Box 622, Newport, NP198ZJ, United Kingdom. Telephone 0870-745-5790. In Australia, write P.O. Box 6200, Doral, D.C., New South Wales, 2158. Telephone 1-300-650-577. Everybody in the church can be his friend.